Hi, good. Thank you. Thank you so much, TJ. Thank you. Good evening, you. Board of Commissioners and the citizens of Douglas County. We will call this August 18th, 2020 meeting to order. Board of Commissioners, when I call your name and district, please signify your presence. District 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell III. Present. District 2, Commissioner Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson. Present. District 3, Commissioner Terenia Carthen. Present. District 4, Commissioner Ann jones Guider, Present. And Ramona Jackson Jones, Chairman, present. All of us are here to meet today, and I appreciate your board commissioners, your time and your talent. Tonight, we have an invocation. Our in invocation will be rendered by our own communications director, Rick Martin. And after the invocation, board of commissioners and citizens, uh, I ask that we pledge to the flag. Director Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Chairman Jones, Board of Commissioners, staff, and members of the community. If we could bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you this evening in prayer for your divine intervention and guidance over our elected officials and our community as we continue to live in the midst of so much uncertainty. I pray, Lord, for protection of our leaders, our judges, our government employees, and all of our community. Almighty God, we realize we are one nation under you, but I pray we all realize no matter how different we are, we can live in harmony if we abide by you. So I pray for your hand to be placed upon our Board of Commissioners for guidance and service to all of Douglas County. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Director Rick Martin, uh, for such an uplifting and moving invitation. Thank you so much. Board of Commissioners and citizens of Douglas County, due to the continuation of coronavirus, uh, I hear some noise. If we could mute our microphones, everybody mute the microphones, please. Okay. I'll start over. Board of Commissioners and citizens of Douglas County, due to the continuation of the coronavirus pandemic and the latest increase in the spread of the virus in the community, this meeting is being conducted uh, with the use of virtual technology under the Georgia Opens Meeting Act. We will continue to monitor the governor's emergency executive orders, which have been extended uh, through September 10th, and we will adjust accordingly. Uh, for obvious reasons, it is very important for all of us to remain vigilant with washing our hands repeatedly throughout the day, wearing a mask, which is highly recommended, and also uh, from there, social distancing is critical as well to sustain our health and protect others uh, in the community until a vaccine is developed. With that being said, Clerk, I certainly want to move on uh, and acknowledge public comment today other than related to the public hearing. Is it, has anyone signed up for the public comment? Yes, ma'am. We had one citizen sign in just under the public comment, and that is Ms. Sharon Bachtel. Okay. And you what you do, go. if you could just uh, read all the instructions and our, our requirements, and certainly it has to be germane to the agenda tonight. So if we could do so, uh, Lisa, if you could read the instructions to Ms. Bachtel and uh, go from there. Okay, again, we just ask that everyone keep their um, microphones and videos muted until you're called upon to speak. Um, you'll have three minutes to speak when your name is called. Uh, once you reach that three minutes, um, the clerk will interject and let you know that you have exceeded your time and so you will just need to wrap up your comment at that time. Um, so when I call your name, if you could just repeat your name and your address um, so we can have it for the record. Okay, I'm going to start with, um, well, the only one we have is Ms. Sharon Bachtel. The rest of the people that registered are for the public hearing, which will be later in the meeting. Um, so I didn't want anyone to get confused. But um, Ms. Bachtel, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, you can begin. Okay. Uh, Sharon Bachtel, 6331 South Skyline Drive. I am against giving $100,000 to the election board for mass mail-in ballot requests. I am appalled that our Democratic state representatives 
would put this burden on our county when we, they know we have no funds. Voters can get the mail-in ballot request form online for free. This is just another example of wasteful spending. Maybe the Democratic Party and election board should spend more time educating people on how to vote by mail. Do you think we are too dumb to figure it out? Yes, you will be reimbursed by the CARES Act, but when? I heard the county administrator state at a meeting that we can't write any big checks. I'm more worried about the $900,000 request from the health department. If they don't have funds soon for buying supplies for vaccinations, the supplies will be sold out, like the shortages for the PPE. If the Democratic Party wants to give the county $100,000 for a mass mail-in ballot request, then go for it. Leave my tax dollars out of it, and the CARES Act is my tax dollars, too. Are you, are you finished, Ms. Back? I'm finished. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. That's the only one we had this morning or this evening. Okay, thank you so much, Clerk Watson. Certainly, thank you so much, Ms. Batchel, for coming in and stating your uh, opinion regarding the, the uh, mail-in ballots or mail-out uh, notifications. All right, with that being said, we're going to move on to the next topic. And certainly, again, I want to circle back to you, Ms. Batchel. Thank you again for your participation in county government. Board of Commissioners, we have a presentation that's next. Uh, we have a presentation from uh, Lisa Crossman, and I believe I saw Dr. Meemark as well, regarding the status of uh, COVID-19 here in Douglas County. So with no, no further ado, uh, our public health officials are coming up next. Uh, Lisa Crossman. Hey, so I'll go first, um, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Dr. Meemark. No worries, I was trying to be quiet. <laughs> Let me pull up um, our slides here. And um, I wanted to thank everybody for um, joining us this night and um, allowing us to give an update to um, Douglas County. Um, so uh, I wanted to update our numbers uh, last minute tonight too. So I'll try to give you as updated numbers as we can. Um, so right now our cases stand at um, 2,886 confirmed cases for Douglas County, and um, we have um, had 344 hospitalizations with 59 um, people who have succumbed to the disease. And, um, you know, um, with the hospitalizations, I didn't put a slide in, but um, yesterday um, was looking like we might be going in the right direction, um, but um, today our hospital seems to be filled up again, uh, maybe from um, people that came in um, over the weekend. But um, their uh, critical care and um, inpatient beds are critically low today. Um, the good news, though, is that um, the sister hospitals that are in Cobb County just next door, um, they've actually um, come out of um, the critical state in their uh, inpatient and uh, critical beds. And so that's nice to see. There's um, there's a little bit more room there. And so that's, that's um, definitely good to see. They're not all um, hospitalizations due to COVID-19. Um, definitely there are. Um, uh, a good portion of uh, COVID-19 patients that are there, but also um, other um, people who have come in with other conditions that um, required um, care. So um, just definitely a very busy hospital right now. For those of you that um, have not seen our website, um, we have um, some metrics that can give you um, how um, our cases are coming out here. Um, our uh, website shows the cases by the date um, that the person took the test. And so uh, it, sometimes it can get a little delayed, but we feel like it's a little bit more accurate picture of what's been happening. You can see back in the middle of July, we definitely had a, a pretty large surge that happened really across the entire state. And then um, we are seeing a, a decrease. Um, <clears throat> one thing I want people to be cautious of is taking a look at the last two weeks. You might have to even cut that off of the screen because the last two weeks, there's, it's subject to a lot of backfilling of um, reporting data. So some um, tests are not coming back super quick and or they have to go through the system and they get backfilled a little bit later. So, But you can see that we are having a nice trend that's going in the right direction. 
Um, DPH has a new updated look as well and, and offers a whole lot more information. So I want to make sure everybody knew about that. Um, some of you have maybe heard about the, the um, cases per 100,000 over the last two weeks that we look at. Um, back um, just, um, just a few weeks ago, Douglas County was over 400 cases per 100,000, and that was in the extremely high range. Just to give you an idea, any over 100 cases per 100,000 is considered high transmission. So although it's still high, we are still high at 303, it has been coming down. And so I wanted to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank everybody that um, has been helping out by, you know, wearing your mask, socially distancing, washing your hands and avoiding large crowds. Um, these are the things that are helping to bring these numbers down. And so we definitely love to see that and want to make sure we keep going in the right direction. So we can't give up doing all those things that um, we, um, we've been doing. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa now. Thank you so much, Dr. Meemark. So we just wanted to give residents an update on the testing, the COVID-19 testing in Douglas County. So far, we've performed over 7,000 tests, and that's just through public health. Um, our testing percentages, as Dr. Meemark said, um, a lot of our metrics are going in the right direction, and one of them is our, um, positive, our positivity rate. So you can see that our positivity rate has ranged from 1% to 8%. Um, and so the average is five. We are very pleased about that. It's been as high uh, in the 20s during this pandemic. So to see it coming down um, at this rate is very positive. Also, we've been working hard over the past uh, three or four weeks to increase access to testing and are now offering over 3,000 test options to Douglas residents. Um, those test options are not at capacity yet. Uh, we're seeing at about 60% of those test appointments are being taken. Um, so we still have room for growth and uh, basically folks should be able to get a test today or tomorrow at the latest uh, if they've gone onto our website and are looking at for an appointment. Um, also, we're really pleased that our result time is better. Um, in this month, we've seen that our test results are coming back in two to four days. Some of them have actually come back in 24 hours, so we're really excited about that. But in general, we're seeing an average of uh, two to four days. Dr. Meemark, next slide, please. Log in and enter your name. Um, I also wanted to let folks... Excuse me, Lisa, excuse me. Could everyone mute their phones or mute their microphone, please? You hear me? Please mute your microphones so we can finish our presentation. Thank you so much. You can resume, Lisa. Thank you, Chairwoman. So I also wanted to highlight where people can get testing in general. So first of all, as we have uh, during most of this pandemic, we've been able to test at our Douglas Public Health Center on Selman Drive. We offer testing there six days a week from 7.30 to 11 a.m. We also have partnered with CORE, um, that is Community Organized Relief Effort, and they do testing with us five days a week. Um, and you can see some of the locations here. We have we offer two evenings a week at the South Epicenter. Excuse me, um, TJ, can you ask everybody to turn their mics off so they can hear you? Thank you, TJ. Um, so we are offering uh, early morning appointments as well as evening appointments. Uh, we're at the Douglasville Town Center location on Stewart Parkway, two evenings a week. Uh, we are also over at Word of Faith Family Worship Cathedral on Riverside Parkway. I know that's in Cobb County, but it is. Uh, we seem to be attracting an awful lot of Douglas residents to that location um, because of I-20 access. And so that's open from 10 to 4 on Saturdays. And then we just finished a testing opportunity at the Douglas Courthouse, um, and we're working on some additional sites. I just talked to someone this morning about a location in far western Douglas, um, and so it looks like we'll be able to set that up in the next week or so. We have a nice partnership with the Wellstar Congregational Nurses, 
Um, and we're offering two to three events per week in the county to be able to do some pop-up testing locations. Um, all of these sites can be found on our website. If you go to cdphcovid19testing.org, um, and you can see all of the appointment availability. And then lastly, we have a, a wonderful partnership with Metro Atlanta Ambulance Services to do have their paramedics help us out with testing in some of our high risk locations like long term care facilities and homeless shelters. Those are not open to the public, but we do schedule them as needed at those locations. I also just wanted to give you all a brief update um, and these slides are certainly available um, on the website. But we uh, have a new executive order that was just signed this past Saturday by Governor Kemp. It does extend the public health state of emergency uh, through September 10th and the existing safety measures through the end of August. Basically, it um, retained all of the guidance that was in the previous executive orders for businesses to be able to remain open. There were a couple of additions to it, though. Uh, one of them is that for counties and cities uh, in communities that have a high case rate, uh, as Dr. Meemark mentioned, that's over 100 positive cases per 100,000 residents. And remember, Douglas County is about at 300 and something. I can't remember what Dr. Meemark just said. The latest one was today. But the governor's new executive order does allow for local authority um, for mask mandates in communities over that threshold. It also still requires uh, the medically fragile to shelter in place as much as possible, although it does continue to permit them to seek or provide essential services and to be able to go about earning a living. And then lastly, there were a number of recommendations that were previously in place for summer schools that are now requirements for both private and public schools as they uh, begin to open up. The next slide is just simply an active link that will take you to this executive order. It is a 49 page document, so uh, you may have to look just a little bit to find the section that might apply to your particular business or situation. And that's all I have, Dr. Meemark. Thank you. And so um, we wanted to just talk about our um, next steps to reduce transmission. And so it's those things that we've been doing and so grateful to Douglas County for all the signage and reminding folks about wearing their masks. Um, continue to watch your distance um, and um, to wash your hands during the day and uh, avoiding your large crowds as well. That's um, We're definitely seeing a lot of outbreaks that have to do with crowds that are gathering. So, I mean, weddings and parties and um, different things like that. So please keep that in mind when um, you think about um, gathering together. Um, continue to take caution if you are high risk. So uh, we know about um, the people that have chronic medical conditions and who are elderly. Um, but, you know, um, people who are immunocompromised, when I review the death records of our uh, patients who, um, who died from COVID-19, um, it is not unusual to see that they were patients that had cancer that were um, uh, undergoing chemotherapy or had cancer in the past. But also, um, one of the things that we don't think about is patients that have diabetes or high blood pressure or obesity. And I think we all know people like that. And so it's, it's more common than we think. And so we really need to make sure that we take caution because that puts you at risk for having um, uh, more difficulty with COVID-19 and potentially death. Remember all these things that we're mentioning because another set of holidays are coming up and, and we are getting very nervous about that. Um, there's a lot of gathering that happens and we seem to have a spike after the holidays. So we're hoping that we don't see that. Um, continue to monitor vaccine progress. It still looks like we are on target for the beginning of the year and um, uh, public health will have a large role in that. We will be helping and assisting in distributing and administering the vaccine when it comes out. So we are already starting that planning for our communities. And so um, keep on the lookout for that. <laughs> Please. Well, Paige, <laughs> Please. Make sure you get the same amount of money as he did. <laughs> TJ, if you can remind them once again, TJ. Please remember to mute your phones. 
Okay. Yes, everybody please mute your phone and your video and, until you're called on. And then you can unmute your phone and turn on your video if you want. I said, but please mute your phones. Thank you. Um, so let's not, we're going the right way. So please let's not um, become complacent. Um, let's continue with all the things that we know that works and we will try to make it to um, getting our vaccine distributed. And so thank you so much for having us tonight. We appreciate it and everything that um, everybody has done to help out. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Meemark and Lisa Crossman today for presenting to our citizens to bring them up to speed to where we are. Certainly our educational, the Board of Commissioners have launched a very aggressive educational uh, campaign and we are hoping, we see some progress with our numbers coming down, but it still, it still seems like we have some opportunity and uh, certainly we will, I, again, when you all provide me with the science and the data that you, uh, that I've asked for, uh, then we will certainly I'll be meeting with the Board of Commissioners re regarding uh, something maybe entertaining a mask mandate. It's not set in stone, but we want to look at the science and the data. Uh, with that being said, Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments to, uh, for Dr. Meemark or Lisa Crossman before I go on to the next item? Okay. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much again, Dr. Meemark and Lisa Crossman. We appreciate you. Okay. Next, we're going to, oh, did you say something, Commissioner Robinson? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We, we have something, a question from Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's context. Um, I, I do appreciate, thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. I, I do appreciate um, the status. Um, you know, we're, we're, what, six months into this, um, this pandemic. And, you know, beginning in March, and I, admittedly, as my constituents know, I, I voted against sheltering in place. And the reason I voted against it, because I didn't believe at that time that we were ready. Um, there was no data. There was no testing to sufficiently support taking such action, which in turn caused us to knock over the county. Basically, we were pretty much told to plan A was go stand in the corner and let's just see what happens. Right. And so obviously test, you know, time proved out like, okay, so now like as if we were just going to get over this, right. It, this was serious. Right. And I, I think our reaction to this is something I'm, I'm watching it, but I was, I was dead serious because yes, you have the economic side, which we're going to get into, but there was, or what they call quality of life, but there was also life. And you're dealing with my children, my, my in-laws and, my family members and my, my my friends and things of that nature that it was as, as an elected official, I, I have to, I'm looking for, okay, I got to make a decision to knock over my local economy with no data, with nothing. Right? So here we are six months later and I'm watching us get our, we're just getting our minds around testing, just sampling basically. We're only sampling a smaller part of this county. And now we're talking about a nationwide vaccine, 300 million strong, 100 million adults. And I'm like, okay, All right. So I, I appreciate the narrative that we're getting ready for the vaccine, but I'm like, no, I'm unsettled with that right now. We want to prove this out, right? I know there was an ask uh, for additional funding to prepare for that. And by all means, I want to go by my district, 35,000 needles. That's about the size of my district. Okay, no problem. You'll get no objections from me. But you got to show me a plan that y'all really got this, right? It can't be the pretty presentations. It, 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 can't, it just has to be execution because it's like, I don't want to lose a loved one. I, I don't even want, like they said, you don't even want, want your enemies to go down over something that we could have as government done a better job of execution. So at the end of the day, I appreciate this. We're getting better. Uh, by all means, the sites are getting better. By all means, we're getting our minds around it. But to get back to that place of settledness, it's a very important that it's all about execution. Not, not about what I intend to do, but it's what we do. And so, again, I want to encourage, I, I, I do support public health by all means. Uh, I'm there, but I, I just, we need what we need. All right. So when we're being asked for something, it's like, okay, well, what do I get in exchange for that? We're not entitled to this, as it's known. Like, well, it's a choice of up or down, yes or no, or maybe not as much, or maybe less than this. So it's important that that we're honest with each other, 
that we have real conversation that we're just not sort of dismissed through. Um, um, the elected, I mean, we as district commissioners, our voices do matter. And we, we just want to make sure that the administration is sensitive to that. It's just like, no, we, we, we've got to have comfort with what we're saying. Uh, we have to have comfort with what you're saying, and obviously when we make our decision. So I won't go long because we got a long meeting. That's about a couple of minutes there. But uh, one question then to that point, Dr. Mimar, um, you mentioned last time we spoke that probably was sometime next spring is probably perhaps. Can, can you clarify when you thought perhaps reality, just all relative, I know I'm not boxing you, you're not in control of that part, but can you set expectations for the citizens about uh, the reality of a vaccine, which we know is going to start with military and people that are first responders first. When do you think it's going to get to the masses? Can you give give some relative insight and just from what you know, please? That's the only question I got. Now you the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Dr. Me, Mark, are you still there? I'm Lisa. Did uh, Dr. Me, Mark, leave? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know, uh, Chairwoman. Let me let me try to answer that. I'll I'll okay. take that on her behalf. That's uh, fine. She may have had to go. So, uh, Commissioner, I would say that we're watching it extremely closely to see how the vaccine um, unfolds. Right. Um, traditionally, a vaccine development could take years. Right. 18 months is traditionally um, the the typical vaccine production time. We have some vaccines that have been in research and development for a decade or more, right? And so, but I will tell you that for this vaccine development, there is an awful lot of pressure and an awful lot of resources being provided to some of our major pharmaceutical companies to help them move along the R&D in order to produce a safe vac and effective vaccine. Um, we do, the FDA does feel very strongly and has put this out publicly that they're going to make sure that it's safe, that it's at least 50% effective, right? That's their bottom line threshold of an effective vaccine. Some of our vaccines are up in the 95% effectiveness, right, with one shot. And so they're looking at a minor, a basic threshold and then putting a lot of resources to help um, our big pharmaceuticals develop that vaccine. We don't have, public health doesn't have control over that at a local level. What we can have control over is one, keeping our my eye on it, and then being ready for the moment that it's made available. And so what we're hoping to do is to be able to have the supplies and the processes in place, like at our drive-through clinics, to be able to seamlessly move from a testing model to a vaccination model in those settings, um, and that we have the supplies so that we don't get caught in what we did at the beginning of the pandemic, which was a shortage of supplies and test kits and that sort of thing that kind of hobbled us um, at the beginning of this pandemic. So that's currently our strategy is one, make sure that we've got the processes in place that we could move the minute that it starts to transition over to a vaccination model. Number two, that we have the supplies in place to be able to offer those to Douglas residents. Um, and three, that we're like we do with all vaccination, uh, vaccination is that we'd work with our partners in the community so that they're prepared to be able to give those vaccines in, a, in another setting. For example, we currently work with a lot of physicians' offices or the CVSs and the Krogers as they're looking to um, roll out vaccines um, and making sure that they have what they need and the information that they need. So we serve as technical advisors to those providers um, and we would encourage that to happen too. So that's kind of what we have control over. And I'm not sure if I answered your question, um, but it's um, that's what we have control over is being prepared and and being ready to hit the ground running the minutes it, the minute it's made available to us. No, that is sufficient. Again, I, I represent the constituents, and so I'm just I'm an aggregate of their voice, and we just want to make sure that when it's time that we're really ready. So I yield. Thank you, Lisa. You're good thank for you. now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Also, thank you so much, Lisa. If there are no other comments, we're going to move on to the approval of the. 
If everybody, please mute your microphones. Board of Commissioners, I'm going to move on to the approval of the minutes. Board of Commissioners, you have the commission meeting minutes of August 4th, 2020, the work session minutes of August 3rd, 2020, the executive session minutes of July 30th and August 3rd, 2020, um, mid-year workshop minutes of July 30th through 31st, 2020, and a special call meeting minutes of August 6, 2020. Are there any corrections, additions, or deletions that need to be made? No, ma'am. Okay, being none, this the minutes stand as approved. Board of Commissioners, next we lead into our public hearing, which is tab number six. Tab number six is the millage rate uh, before the citizens come forth uh, with their presentation. Certainly we have our uh, County Administrator Mark Teal and our assistant director of finance that will be presenting the information. But uh, I'm not sure if the citizens had an opportunity to look at the website. We updated our website from our first public hearing this morning. And I know that amount of 32.9% was uh, wavering and thrown out there, but we uh, that, impl that information has changed. So uh, I wanted you to listen to the presentation. We've actually tried to minimize that initial percentage. percentage and. Uh, I will not steal the thunder of our county administrator and I will allow him to present. County administrator, you have the floor and I don't know which way, you know, the sequence, if you wanted uh, Sabrina to go first, but you, it's your choice. County administrator, Mark Teal. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Sabrina, you want to go first like this morning? Are you ready? Yeah. Go ahead and shoot. Okay. It. Thank you. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we see it. You can see it now. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this is a chart that Commissioner Robinson had requested, and I think it just kind of shows a good history and kind of also kind of paints a picture of how we've got here and what our county policies have been in the past. Uh, as you can tell, it just outlines everything from the year 2008 to 2020. Uh, we have the value of a mill. As you can see, it's ranged from anywhere as low as you know, 3.4 all the way up to now 4.9. Um, and then the millage rate as well. We've had 12.25 um, right now. We're pro proposing 11.638, so it isn't the highest we've ever had. Um, and then it has kind of the change of decrease and increase. And in 2010, we had about 8.12%. 2013 was about 22% increase. Uh, 2017 was 5.55%, and 2019 was 5.4% of the increase in tax revenue dollars. Um, and then we also are showing our ending fund balance and then what that is as a percentage of our general fund expenses. And you can tell our uh, policy is to have 10% uh, of our general fund expenses in our unassigned fund balance in our general fund. And we've met that every year with the exception of 2010. And I just kind of going to go over some notable mm -hmm. items, what showing how the policy has been on affecting cash flows. And then when we look at that, and then you look at the value of the rollback column, which is under column E. So whenever we speak about the rollback, anything that you get through a reassessment, which is just basically inflation, where you know home values are trending higher, you know, sales are higher. Um, it's just how the county normally would be just not rolling back and just going with inflation, because as things are selling higher, the economy is better, things cost more, everybody feels inflation, including the county. Um, and as you can tell, just in from 14 to 2019, it's over 8 million. And if we would have rolled back in 19, which we did, uh, we didn't roll back. We kept it the same, but it would have been about 1.9 million. So in 19, we did not roll back. But in these years, it was over 8 million. It just kind of shows that the county as a whole, if they would have chose to just go with inflation, we might not need such large increases whenever you know, items hit. So just kind of going over some large items that affected uh, in 2008, we purchased the Sabrina, jail. Sabrina, hold on one second. So whoever's number is 361-356-6617, please mute your phone. Right in the hall. Okay. okay, go ahead, thank Sabrina. You. All right, thank you. Um, so in 2008, you can see we purchased the land for the new jail for $9 million, 
which we actually ended up later getting that reimbursed through SPLOST, and I'll go over that too, but it was an original purchase out of the general fund as the decision was made. In 2009, uh, we had about 3.1 million in unplanned road projects from flooding. Granted, 1.7 million was reimbursed through FEMA. And again, kind of like the pandemic, the floods of 2009 were unprecedented, something we did not expect. We were lucky enough to get a good amount of FEMA reimbursement, but they don't cover 100% of the cost. In 2010, we had to give 1.3 million to our partners at West Georgia Regional Library for the construction of a new library. In 2011, we didn't have any large things that I can notice, but we did take advantage of a credit in our retired contribution. And we also did amend the budget downward 3.5 million mid-year, which is again, something that's proposed on this agenda tonight as well, is amending the budget downward on the expense side. And in 2012, there wasn't anything very of any significance. In 2013, you can see we spent 2.8 million in increased public safety expenditures about 727,000 of that was new sheriff vehicles. And then there was just additional costs that were operating with the new jail. And then we also moved the fire and EMS headquarters. They were moved to an existing building, which required additional operating costs. Um, in 2014, this is when we began service delivery negotiations. And I know some citizens have asked why we can't adjust loss. And that's kind of where this goes until um, every time we have a service delivery, that's when the percentages are broken down between what the cities get versus the county. So we're kind of stuck right now until 2022 on the breakdown of that. And that's also when we had to split out the general fund into three buckets, but we had to also show our uninc, our fire and EMS and our animal control fund. So those moving those funds out of the general fund will sometimes kind of make the budget not look as reflective. And if you ever are wondering why the budget changes a citizen, Reviewing the budget presentation we do each year will kind of break down all those cost differences where if there was one transfer to cover health care from one fund over the other. It's all essentially the same pot of money, but we have to report it differently due to the service delivery. Um, and in 2015, you can see we've had spent $1 million to purchase the Bleakley building. That is the building that is now where the tax and tag office as well as our new fleet building off Fairburn Road. Um, and then this is something new from this morning, but I thought it was worth, you know, mentioning. And this is something that I know our financial advisor, David Corbin, has presented as well in the past. Not even just looking at um, notable items affecting cash flows that we've spent out of our general fund that normally capital items, you're not going to use your fund balance. You would do bonds. We've also had a lot of reliance on one-time revenue sources that have gotten us through our budget. So in 2015, we got uh, $7 million in tax funds or a one-time, and then we also received a one-time revenue transfer of SPLOS excess. So when the 2010 jail, um, jail SPLOS ended and all the funds were totally done, whatever was remaining, we were able to transfer back into the general fund. And then in 2016, we were able to get 5.2 million of SPLOS excess in jail, and that was when the property got reimbursed for that 2008 purchase. Um, and then also in 2016, we spent $4 million out of our general fund towards the new animal shelter. And then in 2017, we completed the animal shelter at a cost of $1.7 million. And then we also had to spend $2.2 million to renovate the Bleakley building and to get it into where we needed it for operating. In 2018, we spent half a million for a new video security system for the courthouse. We had $4.3 million in vehicles. And that was for our sheriff and Connect Douglas fans, but the Connect Douglas fans, 80% of that was grant funded. Um, we also had $3 million in Bleakley renovations, and we also did receive a one-time revenue source of $850,000 when we sold the old jail. So that was something that helped us kind of up our revenues. Uh, in 2019, we spent $1.5 million in courthouse renovations, and we had security upgrades to the courthouse and at 2.6 million for a fixed bus route system, which again, a large portion of that was grant funded. And we also received a one-time revenue source of 1.3 million for the insurance claim on the warehouse fire. So as you can kind of see from here, from the history of just not rolling back when we had those you know, five years and then also all these large hits that have hit our general fund for capital items or these large revenue sources have been kind of what have been getting the budget through to this point. And we just kind of wanted to paint that picture for the citizens so they can see that, that how we've gotten to where we are, basically. 
Is there any questions from any commissioners? Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. No point where Sabrina, but okay. All right. So again, for, for the citizens, I'm going to sort of just um, refresh and repeat what I said this morning, which I think is important. Uh, Sabrina did an excellent job of trying to, uh, of not trying to, but 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 framing our history to understand where we are today, and this is to deal with perhaps um, depending on how you get information um, and what your source of information. Um, these meetings are invaluable. While I appreciate Facebook and all the internet and all that, there's nothing like an open meeting. And I do miss the citizens. I, I, I'm a high touch person. I'm not a high tech. I don't live out there. But this is where it matters. Well, you can look somebody in the eye. You can feel their spirit. Obviously, we're doing it through technology, but this is the best we can do right now in light of our current situation. But again, I asked to go back to 2008 because I, as being the chair of the finance committee, because it was important. I gave context for the 12 years I've been here. I've been in every room, every meeting. No one can tell me what went on, how it went down. No, I was in every room. And what's important here is that if you think about from a policy perspective, and I'm gonna keep this simple. People ask, well, the county is broke. No, we're not. The county is not broke. What we're out of is pretty much we're out of cash, which is not being broke. It was our choice and our priorities during the prior administration. And I made the comment earlier, you can't be a Democrat and a Republican at the same time. You have to pick them. Right? So going back to the Republican administration, again, think about the chunks of money that we spent coming in 08. We built a jail. And I say that when we built the jail, when we took $10 million out of the general fund, cash for 30 acres. Any of my real estate people out there, Anybody out there who understand housing, we spent 10 million cash for 30 acres, all right? That, that, that drops you. Then the Great Recession hit, and before the Great, great Flood, the 500-year flood. So think about it, we're 10 million down in cash. Then we go into a Great Recession with zero growth, all right? So we decided to put on the ballot in an off year, a jail, $120 million. We impoverished the city as well as ourselves. All we had is a half million square foot building. That's it. No roads, no nothing. Neither, none of the three cities got anything because it was a single source item. That was the priority of that administration. All right, so then obviously all of our values dropped down, 40%. Number one in the state in foreclosed sales. Number one in the state in distressed sales. Second in the region of unemployment and fourth in the nation in personal bankruptcy. All of you who lived here, we know what those numbers are. So think about it, so everything's down. So here we are in 2011, it's like, okay, y'all know we down. We're 40% down in the digest, the residential part. We raised the military rate, and, and my comment back then was like, okay, if you're gonna raise the rate, get what you need. You never nickel and dime the people. Oh, we're just gonna do a little bit now. We're just gonna slip it in there. Okay, we're in the middle of a, a great recession. Two years later, we raised it another 24%. That's 35%, ladies and gentlemen in two years. Think about it, 35%. Then in raising the rate, we should have left it perfectly alone at 12.5. And this is my argument to those who understand monetary policy, never politicize the interest rate. That's why the president is separate from the Federal Reserve. Don't be over there tinkering with the money, leave that alone. But here we are, we're politicizing it. We, we said it where it perfectly needed to be, but then we decided to begin to roll back. We got cash, but we're gonna give it back. But then we decided to spend. We decided, well, we may not get another spa. So we decided to use our checking account for major purchases. What we do, we, we built $5 million for our animal shelter. So $120 million to cage 800 people, five million cash to cage 80 cats and dogs. Think about our priorities. We decided to, to build out what we wanna call the, what we wanna call the, um, the courthouse, $6 million. So five plus six is 11. We spent another $4 million on that tax commissioner building. That 14, 15 million, 15 cash. Now we're, the height of our general fund was around 24 million. That's 15 right there. Then we decided to do what? We decided with that rollback for five straight years, 
five straight years, the county gave the citizens relief during good times. You give relief during bad times, not good times. So that was $9 million. So nine plus 15 is 24. 24 from 24 leaves what? Zero. Ooh, you're at your fun bot. You're at the bottom of your policy. Oh boy. All right, so here we are, you're coming into a new administration, right? So now we're at this place where not only do we have a hole from the historical spin down, you've reduced your revenue stream down, and now we've got a budget that was overflexed, right? A perfect storm, right? That we're having to sort of dismantle the 2020 budget. Now we get the pandemic hit. I go back to earlier, we didn't anticipate this coming into 2020. Nobody did, right? So here we are. We're sitting here with a hole as big as $15 million. We've rolled back $10 million. And then we're sitting here, we got a budget that's $15 million over the limit. Um, one of my citizens, um, uh, Mr. Pierce, called this out last year during last year's budget. It's like, I don't know what you guys are doing, but you swung this thing 15 points. Don't worry, Mr. Pierce, we're going to fix that later in the budget year with a cap on how we spend, uh, like deficit spending. But this is the equivalent of a localized deficit spending. And it caught us. But the pandemic gives us a perfect do-over. We didn't, we didn't know this was going to happen, but think about it. We had to knock the local economy over. I mean, that was shattering. Look, we, we're not Congress. I can't drop $2.6 trillion on anybody. But if it wasn't for Congress, both Republican and Democrat, they came through. I mean, it was an off-year, an off-budget moment. These guys dropped $2.6 trillion on us. And it's holding. If you notice, our SPLOS numbers are holding. You guys have excess cash. You're all sheltering in place. But you are spending. We haven't missed a beat on our bonds. Our loss is holding. But that's what I call a morphine drip. At some point that you know in Congress, they're like, okay, we can't keep doing this. They're going to take us off that morphine drip. So our point is where we are right now is that, okay, that's how we got us here. Now we know where we're at. And we're faced with making the decision that how do we get through this moment until we get to the other side, All right? We're talking about 18 months. We're paying for this year's budget, but it's like, guys, you only got one time to deal with this thing, All right? We just can't pretend like it, it, it didn't happen. And I'm going to close with this. Our basement is flooded, and it's to the second floor. We can't put a blanket down pretending like the basement's not flooded. It's flooded. And so right now, my, 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 my sentiments here as the chairman of finance, y'all need to know what y'all looking at. I'm not going to seem like it's, it's the end of the world. It's not. But at the same point, we got one move, one time right now to get this right. And so I think I appreciate the administration for being honest and showing the historical context. I appreciate the honesty of the conversation that's going to come back, um, come out of the public um, hearing. And I just say that right now, uh, we've got a hard decision to make. I'm going to go ahead and yield the floor, Madam Chair. Can, can y'all go ahead and make sure people um, cut off? It is yes. great concentration. Uh, but I'm going to yield the floor. We'll let you clean it up. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's good enough. Okay. And thank you, Vice Chairman Robinson. I know you were trying to get to the point of the $4.9 billion in the pipeline, but you, you can get to that later for the economic development pipeline so the citizens could realize. And I don't believe the other administration had anything in their pipeline. So we're going to move on. And I'm going to bring the county administrator back up and I ask everyone, please, to mute your microphones, please, and allow our county administrator to present. County administrator, you have the floor. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Okay, I'll start with the short PowerPoint. So the chairman's been pushing uh, pushing staff to get this millage down as, as low as possible. These first couple of slides came from the chairman, um, and the last one was uh, uh, one from finance, which you'll see later on. And we can see pull it up in a spreadsheet and look at it real time at any point. Hold on just one second. I got to move. Okay, so comparative millage rate increase history. So during part of the recession, the first, the end of it, and then a couple of years after. So we were at 0 0.106 mills increase, uh, 2009, 2010, 1.968. And 2013 was 2.35 mills, and then 14 was no increase. Um, so 2017, no increase, 2018, no increase, 2019, no increase, 2020, 
currently what is proposed, which is less than what was advertised in uh, Sentinel, um, is 1.425 mils. And that would be the increase above, uh, it doesn't include the rollback. So millage rate comparison, uh, 13 was 12.25, 14 was 12.153, and you can see how the numbers keep going down. Uh, 2015, 11.8, uh, 2016, 11.2, and then from 17 to 19, we went 10.7, 10.2, we kept it at 10.2 in 2019 with no rollback. And currently for uh, proposed for 2020 is 11.638. So the cumulative revenue, and Sabrina went over some of these numbers, but this might show you a little bit better. So 2014 through 16, if we had not rolled back, uh, that was about three point, almost 3.6 million. 17 through 19, and actually 19, we didn't roll back, but um, so 17, 18, part of 19. I'm not sure about that, but anyway, the total for those, that could have been 16, 17, 18, was 5.6 million. So the total for those years, which was the same as what uh, Sabrina had given before, was around almost $9 million if we had not rolled back. Um, as far as what's currently proposed, so the annual impact, which 1.425 mils above uh, what the current millage rate is, which is around 10.13, I think. Um, is that correct, Sabrina? 10.13? 10.213. Uh, yeah, 10.213. Sorry, left out two. So 1.425 above that. So these are what the annual impact would be and the monthly impact for houses from 100,000 to 300. So the average Douglas County house is a $200,000 house. Um, so the annual impact with this proposed millage, millage increase would be $105 per year or $9 a month. There you go. Any questions from the board? Okay, any questions from the Board of Commissioners for Mark? Okay, if there are no questions, Mark, uh, are you finished? No and I'll open up the public. I'm finished with this one, Madam Chair, and I'll proceed to the next uh, the next slide. Okay, you have a question for Commissioner Guider. Commissioner Guider? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. This morning, uh, you were saying it was uh, 1.8 instead of the 1.425 it was 1.813 i think or something like that oh that's the value <laughs> from the rollback well yeah y'all are it's kind of confusing one time you use the value with the rollback and sometimes you use it without the rollback so uh what are what's being proposed here with or without the rollback Mm -hmm. So the, the rollback is included, but what these numbers show is what you would pay in addition to 2019 numbers. So 19 what already rate, includes the are, rollback. Is the, millage, is the millage rate being proposed this time, is it with the rollback or without the rollback? It's with the rollback. The rollback would be included in that millage rate increase. It has to be. So the 1.8 figure that you gave us this morning is off the table now? That's on the next slides. Um, so <laughs> this number is the rollback has been subtracted from this number. So the reason being because citizens are already paying the rollback. They're already paying that number. So this would, this would be how it would affect them going forward if that millage rate was approved. You see what I mean? This would be the increase on their taxes. So this, you're proposing a millage rate of 1.425? No, ma'am. <laughs> so if everybody would please mute your phones, we hear people talking in the background. So please mute your phones. 
All right, sorry, Commissioner Goddard, go ahead. Well, you, you plugged in up there on the uh, dashboard 1.425. Is that the proposed millage rate? Yeah, Sabrina, what's the what's the rollback? 0.388? The rollback is 9.825. So what that is is the Department of Revenue, anything that shows the county as getting an increase in tax revenue for anything that comes from reassessments, they force us to roll back the millage rate to become revenue neutral. And so we have multiple slides we've shown, but I know we've been told in the past that the 10 showing the difference to the citizens from the last year's millage rate really helps them, you know, have a grasp on it better because that's what they paid last year. They paid based off the 10.213. So and this is just the difference. Yes, ma'am. That's okay. correct. Okay. Now, obviously, if somebody came back with a higher assessment and they were one of those people, then they'd have to just go off of the assessment. But for comparative purposes, if you look, if your value was, if your assessment was no change, this uh, chart right here would be the exact amount you'd be paying more per year with the 11.638 millage rate. It's kind of confusing because it just depends on what their assessment looked like this year. But I mean, anybody could take this chart and figure it in. If they take what their assessed value is, where it says you know, the 200,000 and they times that by 0.4, that gets them to 40% of their assessed value. That's where that 80,000 is. And those who have the homestead exemption, if you subtract out 6,000, that's gonna get you a taxable value of 74,000. But every mill, is based off a thousand. So what we would do is you divide that seventy-four thousand by a thousand, and you'd get seventy-four. And then you would times that by the one point four two five. Or if they wanted to know their entire tax bill, they could times that by the eleven point six three eight of the total okay. millage, and that'll get them how much of the this county's is, portion only. This is just a difference. Yes, ma'am. This what we're showing right here is just so the average citizen can look at it and say, okay, with this proposed amount. The average um, homestead is 200,000, so they'd be paying an average of uh, 105 more per year or $9 more per month. Okay. Thank you. No. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner sure. Geiger. Mark, if you could just run down the whole list if the, if the market value of the home is 100,000 and then just let them know what it would be annually and then per month, and I think that would just help since we have our citizens on the line tonight. Okay, so the so the increase as compared to last year's 10.213 millage rate, which is what you paid last year. So for a $100,000 house, you would pay $48 more per year or $4 per month. For a $125,000 house, you would pay $63 per year or $5 per month. For a $150,000 house, you would pay $77 per year or $6 per month. For a $175,000 house, you would pay $91 per year or $8 per month. Uh, the average household for Douglas County, $200,000, you would pay $105 per year or $9 per month. So for $225,000, you would pay $120,000 per year I mean, sorry, $120 per year more or $10 per month. For a $250,000 house, you would pay $134 per year or $11 per month. For a $275,000 house, you would pay $148 extra per year or $12 per month. And for a $300,000 house, you would pay $162 per year or $14 per month. Thank you, Mark. All right, you. Uh, if there are no other questions from the board, I believe I saw a hand. I saw our attorney, Bernard. Do you have a question for our county administrator, attorney Bernard? Yeah, I, I just want to make one point of clarification, Madam Chair, so it's clear to the public. The, the numbers in, okay. that have just been gone over by Sabrina and Mark assume that if the board were to adopt that particular proposal until the board acts there is no there's no basis for which to calculate this is just a table that's up that is being considered so i just want to make sure it's clear 
so the public is uh, is clear that the advertisement is for an increase until the board acts there's nothing and then when they act that's whenever the numbers can be finalized okay yeah, thank that's you why, that's why these pages say proposed okay agreed, thank agreed. okay thank you uh county administrator martill carry on you you i believe you have some more information for the citizens yes ma'am just hold on one second i'll pull this up Okay, so there's a little bit more information here than we had this morning. So the column on the left and the column on the right, um, the column on the left is for the $10.75 million or $10.7 million unassigned fund balance on the next page we'll get to. The one on the right is for the $9.2 million unassigned fund balance. And the one in the middle is where we left the... Uh, the mid-year retreat. So we'll start with the one in the middle. So when we left the mid-year retreat, so our COVID expenses were 1.3 million and our CARES Act reimbursement were 1.3 million. So everything else down here is the same and I'll go through these bottom numbers after I compare the other ones in yellow here. So on the one on the right, which was the one was that was proposed this morning. So other financing sources from the CARES Act reimbursement would be $5.538 million. Um, so we had, uh, so ACCG and now the state, the state has revised their, their Q&A. So 100% of public safety, essentially frontline personnel, there's some more definitions, but um, are reimbursable from the CARES Act. Uh, if you go to the COVID expenses, um, so right now the COVID expenses are at 1,108,000 and that's subject to change, but currently it includes 808,000 from the resolution that was a poor, approved by the Board of Commissioners, uh, 200,000 possibly that would be going to the Development Authority for the small business grants and $100,000 possibly for uh, the mailing of ballots, which those two are on the agenda today. So if you go to the left column, and this one applies to the $10.7 million fund balance on the on the next page, and I'll explain those when we get to it. Um, so $5.5 million revenue from CARES Act, that's the same. The $1,108,000 here for COVID expenses, if you can see my cursor, that is the same. So in addition to that, there is a reduction in the transfer to the healthcare fund of $1.58 million. So if you go to the dashboard, okay, no, let's explain these. So part of this process that we've, we've gone through, um, so we've reduced expenses and all three of these include the same one. So elimination of, and I'll go by, I'll try to highlight these one by one. So elimination of uh, fiscal year 2020 BIRs, 2.171 million. Uh, reduction in the defined benefit plan uh, to the minimum requirement instead of the recommended, uh, that would be $1 million. And these are all um, essentially cuts. So frozen mm -hmm. personnel, um, 451,595 dollars. So elimination of the remaining training budget for 2020, uh, $331,000. Elimination of uh, fiscal year 2020 Christmas bonus uh, for employees, that's 100,000. So expense credit for operating changes. Um, so that was the reduction in uh, operating budgets for, um, for departments, 800,000. That was in addition to some other um, subtractions that we had already made up above. Implementation of furlough program, so five days for uh, all county employees, excluding elected officials, would be $723,857. So now if you go to the dashboard, so we'll start out with the one on the left. So column H, 
I'll highlight that column. Can y'all see that? So column H was where we left the retreat. So minimum fund balance of $10,570,000. So with the changes on the other page, so that would be a minimum required millage increase of 2.35 plus 0 0.5 that was recommended for a 0 0.5 mil for economic development. So you add those to the 2019 millage rate. So your total would be 13.063. This is what was advertised in the Sentinel. 13.063 mils with a 3.238 millage increase at the bottom. So the one we discussed it this morning was column I. So that was reducing the uh, minimum unassigned fund balance to $9,200,000. So that would be a required millage increase of 1.175. That's the top yellow one in the middle. Um, so it was proposed to for 0 0.25 mils for economic development instead of the 0.5. Um, so you add those to the 2019 millage rate and you have 11.638 mils, which is the 1.813 uh, total millage rate increase that includes the rollback. So as of this morning, Commissioner Carthen had asked for the unassigned fund balance. So we're looking at column J now. So column J and then the highlighted uh, line here. So the unassigned fund balance of uh, 10.78 million. So after today, if the board approves the uh, the budget amendments, our budget would be at 10 million. Well, be 107 million 800 thousand dollars. Correct, uh, Sabrina. That's correct. So 10 percent so of that's 10.78 million. So. The minimum required millage increase with the changes on the other page that, that are associated with this column would be 1.175 mils plus a proposed uh, millage increase for economic development of 0 0.25 plus the current millage rate of 10.213 yields the same 11.638 millage rate uh, for 2020, which would be a 1.813 millage increase. So any questions from the board? Thank you so much, Mark. Any questions or comments from the board? So sorry. All right. Well, uh, are you finished, County Administrator? Are you, your presentation, you're complete? Thank you yes, so much. Very good I'll job. Stop, Chair. I, can, I can bring it up at any time. That you that you want, and also this information is made available to our citizens. I believe if you could share that with the our citizens uh, county administrator to allow them to be they can visit the website today. Or should I say celebrate? Yes, ma'am. These presentations are on the website, um, and they are available to view. And if you have any trouble, please feel free to email me. You know the clerk, um, anyone, and our emails are on the website. Okay, thank you so much, County Administrator Clerk. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am, I'm ready. Okay, this is, um, I, I'm getting ready to open the public hearing it, but if you could just read the instructions for our citizens so they understand how we will proceed by, you know, making sure you tell them the time frame, the time limit, they need to state the address and, you know, name and address. If you could provide instructions, we'll move okay. forward. I'll um, just start by saying um, we have a list of people who pre-registered to speak. I'm going to start with that list and um, name by name in order of, of how they of when they registered. <clears throat> Once we get through that list, um, if there's anyone else on the call um, that wants to speak, we'll um, ask at that time. Um, when you um, we again, we ask that everyone please mute your phones, your uh, computers, and keep your cameras off unless you are speaking. Um, when I call your name, you can unmute and turn your camera on if you like, and then you'll have three minutes to to speak. 
once you reach that three minutes, I will um, interrupt you and let you know that you've exceeded your time and you'll just need to wrap up your comment. So again, when I call your name, if you could repeat your name and your address um, and then and then go ahead and with what you need to say. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Joseph Granger. Mr. Granger, are you on the line? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can go ahead and start now. Thank you, and I really appreciate the Board of Commissioners for allowing us to have this forum. Uh, thank you for your time, and thank you for allowing our voices to be heard. I think you're frozen. At least you might want to go back and go yes. to the next guy and just try to keep moving though, because that's going to be a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, if you can hear us, Mr. Granger, we'll come back to you. Um, the next uh, citizen is Mary Beth. I'm sorry, Mary Beth Klein. Are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay. If you can go ahead now, if you'll just repeat your name and All your right. address. My name is Mary Beth Klein, and our address is 6742 Creek Valley Way in Douglasville. I've been a resident of Douglas County for 47 years. In those 47 years, I have never seen such fiscal irresponsibility by any commissioners as the current Board of Commissioners. Here are some examples of how you... Here are some examples of how you have and are impoverishing the county. You, the Board of Commissioners, have spent money as if it came from a bottomless pit. Most of you have hired administrative assistants to do the work for you. In my opinion, if you don't want to do the work that comes with a job, you shouldn't be in that job. You have committed this county to a bus system that is not profitable and will never be profitable. I've observed on many occasions empty buses driving around the county. You poured money into Fox Hall, which will never be profitable. Commissioner Robinson refuses to comply with a settlement that he and his attorney negotiated, and the county is responsible for paying the legal fees concerning this matter. You have approved additional money for the coroner's office, despite evidence that the coroner's office is being investigated for improper activities. You have used funds set aside for rainy days to pay for other programs and active activities in the county. You don't understand that the purpose of a rainy day fund is to cover emergencies. It is not another pot of money to dip into whenever you want to fund something. And now that we are truly in a rainy day with budget shortfalls, you want to put this on the backs of the tax paying residents by increasing property taxes. You may think that tax paying citizens will forget about all these things before the next election cycle for county commissioners, but I assure you that you are sadly mistaken. This concludes my presentation and thank you for this opportunity. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Klein. Um, I'm going to try to go back to Mr. Granger. Mr. Granger, did you, were you able to connect back in? Yes, ma'am, I apologize. Okay, that's that okay. Technical difficulty. Okay. I, I, okay. Want, I want to thank everybody and um, start off by saying that this is a risk that we're taking. As Mr. Robinson had said um, back when this happened in 2008 and we were not smart about the way that we were funding um, using our funds we impoverished our city and this relief should come during good times not bad and we're in the middle of the pandemic we do not have a certain economic outlook for the next year or two years due to the volatility of COVID-19 and many people are leveraging the CARES Act mortgage forbearance to help their families surviving during this pandemic the uncertainty of how that the future affects this will have on our housing market and our community adds to the uncertainty of the impact of the increase in property tax. The bulk of the burden of the housing property tax is rest upon the housing consumers, whether owner occupants or tenants. 
In the short term, owner owners of rentals cannot shift the burden to tenants, but in the long term, it will increase rental prices throughout the county. Property taxes averages 19% of the rental value of a house. First, it's going to make our living expenses of owning, renting a home in Douglas County unmanageable for those families who are having the highest economic impact of this virus. This, this will force some families to sell their houses. And with the current housing market and our homes being valued so high, this will be an attractive offer for most, most homeowners. Homeowners will be able to sell high to outside property management companies due, in, due, due to the current market value of houses. When outside agency controls the property within our community, we lose our values. Outside agencies do not care about the impact upon the community. It's led to safety concerns within our community and an increase of police presence and resources economic impact of having an outside property management company in our community and the cultural impact it has as well is not worth funds raised through this tax increase. Families are renting homes waiting for the economy to come back and making ends meet will not be able to afford the rental prices in our community once owners, once the owners of those rentals are able to shift the rental prices based off of this impact. We are going to be forcing families out of our community. If the rental property is too expensive and the condition and perceived value of those, those houses in those areas um, do not improve, those properties are going to end up vacant. And the presence of vacant homes comes with a higher level of crime and illegal activities by adolescents. Like Mr. Robinson said, we do not want to impoverish our city. We want to be mindful of what's to come. The guidance that we saw in the presentation compared post-recession to pre-pandemic. That's apples to oranges. The decision is a bet. And at the end of the day, we're betting against our community, against the people that put their faith in you. I'm asking that you look for a better solution and to bet on our community rather than <laughs> just play. At the end of the day, the risk you are betting on will not benefit Douglas County. It will not benefit our community values, not benefit our community's vision, and will not benefit our immediate future. I'm asking that you all take a mere moment and ask yourself where your values and decisions meet the long-term goals you have for this community or just short-term profit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Granger. And again, I just want to remind everyone to keep your phones and, and computers muted uh, while others are speaking. Um, the next citizen who signed up is Myrta, Myrta Carpenter. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Are you on the line? Okay, can you repeat your name and your address, please? Okay, I guess we lost her. I thought she was on the line. Okay, let's move on to Mr. David Carpenter. Are you on the line? Okay. Um, next in line is Marta Bolano. Are you on the line? I am on the line. I am okay, on the line. Okay, great. If you if you could just repeat your name again and your address. My name is Marta Bullino, 9037 High Street, Douglasville. And first of all, thank you very much for uh, allowing me the time to uh, address the board. Uh, I also appreciate the fact that you have gone back to relook at the budget and see where you could find economy. As some of the other speakers have said, this is a really difficult time. It's a difficult time for uh, all of us that are facing uh, economic challenges, and there are a lot of folks that are looking at evictions, looking at foreclosures, no jobs, and closing businesses. So it's not really a great time for an increase in taxes. I recognize that the county has not had the uh, revenue stream that they had hoped for, but on the other hand, the public is also not able to meet uh, a higher tax increases. And I, th I think that it's 
uh, first of all, you've, you've given it a good shot to try to maintain or to not go to the 33%. If uh, you could maintain it at last year's, it would probably be even best. But appreciate the effort, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Um, we'll go to our next citizen, um, Mindy Doglametti. Did I pronounce that right? Are you on the line? Okay. Let's go to Ms. Margaret. So it's not really a great time for an increase in taxes. I recognize that the time um, can you past, can you please mute mute your phones? Okay, the next uh, citizen, Margaret Williams. Are you on the phone, Miss Williams? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's go to Miss Carmen Takuchi. Are you on the phone, Carmen? Okay, uh, Lee Shaddix. Are you on the phone, Ms. Shaddix? Okay. Ms. Dot Paget, are you on the line? Ms. Tina Nichols? Ms. Nichols, are you on the line? Okay. Um, let's go. We had a Miss um, Stacy Hagler. Were you on the line? I am, but I spoke this morning. Thank you. Okay. And um, I believe that's all I had. Um, Hi, my name is Linda. I submitted an email to be added, please. Okay. What was your name? Uh, Corinne Lindo. Okay. You can go ahead and speak. And I also did. Yes, my okay. name is Corinne Lindo. I, I'm a homeowner at 3410 Anna Ruby Lane in, um, you know, the county. And I just think it's unconscionable that the, the county could even consider increasing property taxes during this pandemic when people have been out of work and struggling for months. The federal government is trying to infuse communities with money and the county is trying to um, extract from the blood of its citizens. I mean, I, I just cannot believe what you are thinking. Many counties around the city, I'm actually working government myself and I'm very disappointed in um, how this government manages its, its, its capital projects and its construction. I've worked in government for several years, and many governments, that's the last resort is to tax their citizens. They, they tighten their belts, and they, they solicit government grants for other projects. There's so much money the federal government has for infrastructure improvements in the community um, instead of using taxpayers' money for these capital projects. I mean, you guys are not leveraging the government's grants the, for, 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 for uh, uh, transportation projects. There's just so many out there. And I constantly look on your website on your meetings to see what kind of grant approvals are coming up. And if you look at Cobb and other counties around the city, um, around um, um, Georgia, they always have grants, 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 grants. And I just don't see Douglas County having grants. Um, and, and capitalize on um, money that the federal government have to improve the communities and make them better, not make them worse, which is what you guys are trying to do. I, I just thought I was dreaming. Please reconsider, because you, there's no way. People are unemployed. Um, their children are home. They're buying additional food. And how could you possibly consider this at this time is just, I mean, I, I can't stand some what's going on in our county government, and, and definitely it's time for a new board. I mean, um, I, I'm just beside myself with this. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to get the next person I have on my list is uh, Stacy Wiggins. Stacy, are you on the line? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, you can go ahead. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys regarding the um, property tax, proposed property tax increase. Um, my wife and I are opposed to the increase for the following reasons. It's many of the reasons that have already been mentioned. You know, the current economic condition of the county or the nation just in general, at a time when many taxpayers are fighting to pay their mortgages and rent payments due to job cuts, reduced salaries, and lower demand for services, et cetera, it's just not prudent to increase someone's tax burden. Property taxpayers, we don't have the option of paying whatever taxes are levied on us in the short term. Of course, we do in the long term with our opportunities to vote. Many of us have already had to reduce our disposable spending because of the pandemic. Raising taxes at this time just created even more stress on the county's economy. Second reason is government should be looking for ways to cut taxes during this time to free up people's disposable money. Getting back to the basics should be a goal. I appreciate the efforts that you guys have made to mandate furlough days, to cut budgets and all that stuff, but the cuts need to go deeper. For example, our company, I had to have my salary reduced for 60 days. We furloughed employees for three to four months. We cut non-essential personnel. We had a hiring freeze. We delayed our annual merit increases. It was very painful, but it was necessary to survive. We didn't have the choice to just raise rates for current customers. If we would have, we'd be looking to go out of business. You know, I would like to add that it's a striving company that's been around for 50 years. Okay, so I just want to th thank you for your time and consideration and do not increasing property taxes at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let me call now on Tammy Kareem. Tammy, are you on the line? Okay. Um, is there anyone on the line that signed in that I did not call? Yeah, I, I did. Okay. You want to go ahead? And Joanne DeLong. Joanne DeLong. I'll go, I'll go next. Doyle. Doyle. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, you can go ahead. Joanne, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Chris was first, though. I'm sorry. Um, um, my name is... I, I think Chris was first, and he's ready to speak, and I can speak after him. Okay, that'll be fine. Chris? Sure, that's fine. Um, yeah, this is Chris Elliott um, in Douglasville, and um, we've, I've been here with my wife and kids for about five years. We moved here and fell in love with the county, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, we didn't, you know, really go back and check all the history of the property tax increases, but the property tax increases here are not anything new, and it's not just the pandemic that's created it. It's been a fight that the citizens have been doing ever since we've been here, and everybody that we've talked to said it continues to go like this. I mean, there's just these these blanket increases on the county, and, uh, you know, you end up having to take the county to court to get your property taxes froze for three years, which is just ridiculous. I mean, especially during a time right now to even try to justify any form of increase with all the economic conditions going on is just outrageous. I mean, I don't know if any of you have been into the stores and seen how much the cost of all proteins and all meats have gone up. I mean, it's 50 to 100% across the board. That's um, across all food. I mean, all food, you don't find it on sale. All food costs and pretty much everything else that you buy has gone up except for the cost of gas. And it, it really takes a hardship on people to increase that also during these times of uncertainty. You know, people are losing their jobs, their incomes down, the, you know, the, the dollars inflating, you know, people think of all the great things about the stimulus money, which it is good. I'm glad that's going in, but also in the long term, that's going to inflate our dollar and make it work less, which is even going to be worse when you're looking at an increased property tax. It's all gonna. It's also gonna increase rents. I mean, obviously, property owners aren't just gonna eat that. They have to pass it on to the renters, which is gonna blanket increase rents across every rental in the entire county. You know, businesses have already been shuttering their doors for the last couple of years out of here. You know, quite a few have gone, and this is this uh, downturn in the economy is definitely gonna have an effect. I mean, a lot of businesses are month to month. They can't sustain a year of, of massively decreased business, and. <clears throat> we're constantly having to fight these property taxes with exorbitant increases. I mean, I just, uh, 
hate to see people leaving the county. We've had numerous friends here that have left the county because of these property tax increases and sold the house. In fact, the people we got our house from did left because we we bought the house, Kurt, and they were getting tired of the property tax increases. So I, I would, you know, try to get you guys to think about trying to make more cuts so that we can be an example for other counties to decrease our taxes in a time of need rather than increase them. And there have been other counties in this state that have done that, so it's not an impossible thing to do. You guys can go back to the drawing board and put in a little bit more work and get those numbers down, and that's that's a certain possibility. And I would, I would uh, behoove you guys to please consider the lives of the everyday people in this county during these trying times, both financially and emotionally, because money's tight, food costs are high, and the stress of friends and family getting sick and passing away from the pandemic is hard enough. My wife is an RN in the ICU and she's caring for the people here in the county that are passing away and it's a very difficult thing to watch. And my my daughter is a speech language pathologist working at a middle school here and it really is unfortunate that we have to even discuss moving out of the county because of these exorbitant increases in the property taxes. That's not a conversation I even want to have because I love this county. The location's amazing. You know, a lot of the people are great, but the, these tax increases are just out of line. And I really, I really think they need to be revisited. So please have some compassion for the people in Douglasville and revisit those numbers for the sake of everybody that's living here. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Okay, Ms. Doyle, if you would like to go ahead and start. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joanne Doyle. I live within the city limits of uh, Douglasville. Um, I, we have been here for two years and we absolutely adore it here. Um, we love our house and we do not want to move, but um, I am seeing an increase of cash offers in this area. I happen to look up and see the proposed plans also for this area of wiping out uh, this area, making it more of uh, the, the business, um, mid-rise businesses and department stores and everything right where my house sits. Um, I know uh, as on these tax increases, uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies, not only providing the information on the website that everyone can understand, but also the employees have no idea how to answer the questions when somebody is, is calling in. If you would just create a graphic of, uh, say for instance, the, the tax notices that come out where the five different areas, because everyone is panicking and I don't think they understand when you're when you're saying 32 percent increase okay that's just on the first area there's five different areas on our tax uh property tax notice and from what i'm told all five areas are going to be seeing an increase well there are those of us that are on a fixed income that we need to know exactly how much our property taxes are going to be, or at least see the proposed in all five areas. So if you would put a graphic on the Douglas County website so that people can more understand what we're facing so that everyone is not in a panic mode. Um, now, as far as, the taxes, uh, it, it, you don't have a mansion tax here. We see a lot of heavy growth in the multi-million dollar homes in this area. A uh, mansion tax would be great and would offset property taxes for the seniors and the disabled. There also needs to be a circuit breaker where there is a limit on the percentage of tax increase from any low income resident or elderly um, that pays in property taxes each year. Um, if we exert political pressure on uh, large uh, tax exempt institutions in this area, if you go to IRS, there's 836 different tax exempt entities within Douglas County alone. Conservative estimates 
there's probably at least half of those that are benefiting from uh, uh, exempt from property taxes. Now, quite a few of those tax exempt companies have probably profited from the stimulus package where many of our low income re residents have not even gotten their first. Ms. Doyle, uh, you've exceeded yeah. your Ms. Doyle, you've exceeded your three minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you go ahead and wrap up your comment? Okay. Well, I do think that in a time of a pandemic, you do not raise the taxes. I'm quite sure our great Christian leaders of this area enjoying the tax exempt status and not paying property taxes that their parishioners are bearing the brunt of during a pandemic would certainly be happy to relieve that great burden off of their parishioners. I thank you for your time. And I am against the tax increase. And please do update the website so that we can see overall the different areas that are being increased. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Um, mm -hmm. I was the next... on the uh, list to speak. I was as well. Okay, I'm, I've still got a couple of names here. Ms. Silvio Razo? Yes, I'm here. Okay, if you could go ahead. Okay, so I'm Sylvia Razo, and I live within the city of Douglasville limits. I'm also against this tax increase. I think that it's ridiculous that at a time when lots of families are struggling and many people probably don't even have $100 in their bank account, that you guys would even think to raise the tax to this extent. I Sorry, Ms. Ms. Razo, can you just hold on just one moment? Could everyone please mute their microphones? Okay, you can you can continue. Yeah, so I I mean even just doing a quick looking at your agendas of of your meeting minutes from the last month, I see that a driving simulator with Zorn Precision Systems was approved for an amount of one hundred eleven thousand five hundred dollars. Of that, twenty two thousand three hundred dollars are coming out of the pocket for Douglas County citizens. Why do we need a driving simulator to train personnel when they've been able to be be trained? <clears throat> To drive without that for time. This is not the time to be, to be adding a driving simulator. Additionally, with that same company, there is a maintenance plan that was approved for $9,975 for a teen driving simulator. Again, not the time for this to be approved. There is also an approved use for county funds to move vandalized statues inside of buildings, which is when I think at the last meeting, again, not time to approve these funds. Sidewalks for Chestnut Log Middle School were approved in the amount of $275,862.29. Why is that being used when the schools aren't even in use at this time? Additionally, for Turner Hill Middle School, $363,846.75 were approved for updating sidewalks, which are not being used. If you add in just in total these couple of items, which I have mentioned, that's $671,984.04 of county funds approved during COVID times to be used for things which I do not think are essential. And I don't know how you think those are essential. Additionally, this is a time when, all, when our unemployment rate in Georgia is currently at 9.7%. How do you expect for people to pay when their unemployment is so high? Just in Douglas County during the month of May, our unemployment was at 11.7%. Given this has reduced in the last month, but even overall for our metropolitan area, it's at 8.6%. This just seems like a very irrational use of our funds during this time. I don't understand how you guys can approve these things. <clears throat> I, and I'm I'm against it. I, I don't I don't think I think that when I am looking at my funds and I see that my expenses aren't matching up, I, I look at how I can readjust my funds. I don't I don't ask someone to charge me less because things are set. And that's it. Here, here. Okay, our um the next name I have on my list is Miss Margaret Williams. Are you on the line, Miss Williams? Okay, what about Ms. Tammy Kareem? Was that you? 
Okay. Uh, who else is on here that signed up? This is Sharon Bachtel, and I had signed up to speak at the public uh, hearing meeting, too. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Sharon. You can go ahead. Okay. At the December BOC meeting, a commissioner stated, we have more than enough money to handle any disaster. At the time, we had $9.5 million in our rainy day fund. He said, we're fine, and then proposed that $25,000 be spent on tourism, and three commissioners voted for that. Next, these same three commissioners voted to give themselves $150,000 for AIDS. Three commissioners voted to pass a budget knowing that it was over by $4.5 million. It cost $9 million a month to run this county. According to the commissioner's handbook, counties should ideally keep three months of expenses and the reserve funds, that would be $27 million, not $9 million. The commissioners did not want to listen to their financial advisor who said we weren't saving enough. Year after year, this commission has spent more than their designated budget, dipping into the reserve fund for their pork. We have seen elected officials and other departments increase their budgets, some by 40%. After listening to some of the commissioners speak this morning at the public hearing, I get the impression that they want to blame capital expenditures, expenditures from other commissions for their budget problems. It's kind of funny because three of our commissioners have been around for multiple terms. Funds for the animal shelter and tax building were collected and reserved for those projects when proposed. This designated tax money follows that project. If the project goes over budget, then that is the problem of the commissioners who let that happen. Three of our present commissioners who were in office then could have assigned this to SPLOS, but did not. The jail was funded by SPLOS. Any money borrowed from the general funds was paid back, so it should have no impact on this commission's budget. In fact, this commission could have saved $20,000 by storing the election equip equipment at the jail instead of renting a building. Also, why, if this commission has decided there's going to be a freeze on hiring in April, did they hire a legislative aide in May? I thought we were all in this together. As far as the millage rates, not increasing for several years, I would like to point out that there was no need for increases. Our tax appraisals went sky high, some as much as 40 to 50 percent starting in 2017, which brought in more tax revenues. So the increases were not necessary. Overspending and bloating this county government has put us in over our heads. Now we have to pay for mismanagement. The people in this county have been hit hard by this pandemic. They have lost their businesses, their jobs, and their savings. Now you want them to lose their homes. Businesses can pass an increase on to customers. What can a person on fixed income do? I have no faith or trust in this commission. I vote no on property tax increases. Thank you. Yes. Great comments. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Bactel. Okay, um, let me go back to, sorry, um, I'm going to go back to ones who didn't answer before, um, <clears throat> Mr. David Carpenter. Okay, um, Mindy Guglametti. Okay, um, Ms. Margaret Williams, um, Carmen Takuchi, Lee Shaddix, Dot Paget, Tina Nichols, Tammy Kareem. Is there anyone who else registered that we did not call on? Is 
Is there anyone who did not register that would like to speak? Yes, I would like yes. to speak. Oh. Okay, just one at a time. <laughs> I would like to speak. Uh, my name is Trina Kimball. Uh, ad the address is 9790 Lake Moore Cove, Villarica, Georgia, 30180. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I would just like to say that I disagree with the tax increase of the 32.96%. Per um, we're going through a pandemic at this time, and there's been citizens who've lost their jobs, having to um, stay at home because of childcare needs. There's businesses that's closing. Um, and I just disagree at this time. And I don't think it's a time for an increase. Perhaps um, you should maybe look at your budget. I mean, we have escrow accounts for our mortgages to pay our taxes. Um, and I just think that um, you need to revisit the tax increase. Um, maybe in the next year or two, if the economy is thriving, then perhaps increase it by maybe 10%. I think 32.9% is a bit steep. Um, currently, there's no nice restaurants or premium shopping um, malls in the area. There's limited transportation um, in Douglas County. So I don't really see the need for the increase, even if we were not going through a pandemic. Um, my husband and I, we've been in this county since um, 1998. Um, in 2001, from 2001 to this current year, our taxes have increased over $10,000. And I just think that's significant. Um, in the city of Villarica, you're paying, we're paying for the police department for Villarica as well as Douglas County. And I just think that at this time, we should not have an increase. Thank you for your time. Thank you, My Ms. Kim. I'm sorry, can you repeat your name? Yes, it's Alex and Lucretia Romani in Ansbury Estate in Douglas Hill. And okay. we're, we are new here. We've been here for one year. We filed a homestead exemption thinking that our property taxes would be lower this year. However, they went up um, for a few dollars. And when I called in, I've called three different places trying to get an explanation of this millage rate. Nobody can tell me what goes into the millage rate, but after listening to you all on the call, it sounds like that the commissioners make all the decisions on the courthouses, the animal, $5 million for an animal shelter is ridiculous. We had animal shelters here before. I lived here years ago. But I think that we're having the money spent incorrectly people make decisions and not thinking through the future the decisions that you're making to spend this money any way you want to spend it i know you make a vote you vote on it but somebody's got to speak up and and like one other person says you're supposed to have two or three years reserved before you start spending money on things that's not needed in this community and then you expect people like us that work every day to pay the price for that. And we didn't get a chance to make a decision on it. We didn't vote on it. We didn't vote on no $5 million uh, dog shelter here. You know, if it's not on, on the ballot, if it's something that costs over a certain amount of money, it should be placed on a ballot, especially when we're expected to pay for that item that you're building or you're putting up in this uh, county. And the other thing is, I don't know who holds you all in accountability for the money that you spend. Uh, I know that there is a commission. I know it's four or five of you guys that make the decisions, but who holds you responsible for the decisions that you make? Um, and if you come to people in the community asking them, you come for people in the community asking them to pay for the faults that people have made back in 2008, and you're still saying 2008 is affecting the budget in 2020, that's ridiculous. You could have made that money up five or six times, but yet I keep hearing y'all go back to 2008. Where's the accountability for the people that's been in the office since 2008? I mean, this this is ridiculous. We're in a pandemic. Uh, fortunately, I haven't lost my job, but people have. A lot of friends have. 
and they have children. They have a responsibility to still try to feed their children when they're not even working, still try to pay the mortgage, still try to maintain a household. It's ridiculous to think you can raise taxes at this time because of you all's inability to spend the money correctly. Somebody has to stand up and take accountability. And I don't know if it's Dr. Ramona Jackson that's in control of this, but if she is, she needs to stand up and take accountability for this money that y'all are throwing away, spending on useless things in this community and then expecting us to pay it back. That's ridiculous. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? I would. Okay. What this was your is, name? This is Paula Britton. I am at 8605 Wood Springs Court in Douglasville. I'm in the city limits. Um, I also have a daughter who's in the county. And so I think I'm speaking for us both. Um, I am opposed to the tax increase. Um, I heard the presentation and uh, you all talking about rollbacks. I have never experienced a rollback. And it, my taxes have constantly been increasing, um, especially over the last few years. Um, I think that anyone who is currently on the board of commissioners um, should be holding themselves accountable. Everyone has been there long enough to have made a difference. And I think this is a horrible time to increase taxes. And you can't even pick my trash up on time, but you want me to pay more for taxes. I don't understand this. I don't understand the thinking. And it is a big disappointment. I know that I'll be more careful when I vote in the future. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Britton. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? I would like to speak. Okay, and your name? My name is Tisha Lovelace. I'm at 3052 Graymont Cloister in Douglasville. I'm in the county. I've had a house in the city limits as well. I've been here for 27 years. And I agree with the previous caller. I have not once seen a rollback in my taxes. Taxes have been increasing consistently from what I've seen on my tax bill. And I am opposed to increasing taxes at this time. I agree with all of the speakers. And in regards to the situation of where we're in the pandemic right now, it is a hardship for all of us homeowners. And just to ask for any increase is ridiculous. I mean, I cannot imagine that the board cannot come to terms with a budget to find ways to cut in other areas than to pass along it to us taxpayers here in the county. I have really, really enjoyed living here in Douglasville, but these consistencies on the tax increases is really making me rethink my home ownership here. So I really, really ask that you all go back and find other ways to cut instead of passing on those expenses to the taxpayers. Thank you. Hello, I don't know if I can be heard. Okay, um, can I, before you start, can I ask everyone to please mute your phones? Have some interference. What was your name, sir? Clayland David. I'm in Perennial Law Subdivision, Douglas County. Um, I'm short and sweet. Uh, I moved here February. Um, moved to Douglas County, then to Fulton County. Uh, before that, but um, never been on a tax commission or anything, but been on H R A board. Um, and my thing is kind of this um, from H R A C. Say you all do raise them, whatever, you do raise the fees and then it's raised. And then the blood from a turn up issue. People just don't pay. Now you're kind of worse off because you did raise it. Now people in revolt, maybe they would have paid if it didn't change. Now they're not going to pay. 
they got to pursue people possibly legally or whatever it takes to do that. And once again, blood from eternal. If you ain't got it, you ain't got it. So now you've actually done something to make your, your, your work off as a county or a city or whatever because you've done something that has led to a revolt of some sort and it actually costs more money. So just kind of caution against it. You do vote to do something, just the unintended consequences of going against kind of the overwhelming voice of the people because I guess it's zero in the column of four. Um, so just kind of wanted to make that known. Thank you. Thank you. And we're still getting um, some pretty heavy interference. So please, if you could just check, make sure you're on the Okay. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? That sounds much better. I'd like to speak really quick. And what was your name? Can you speak up just a little bit? Yes, ma'am. My name is Michael Hitt. I live on uh, Veterans Memorial Highway in Villarica. Okay, um, you can go ahead. So I moved here in 2017 uh, because I, I love the area. And um, ever since I've moved here, I've experienced nothing but the taxes going up, as others have said. But in my instance, my tax appraisal on my house was drastically higher than what I could even get a loan for on my house. And now I'm seeing a, a message to where basically if I round up the number, my taxes are going to go up 33% more. And to me, they're already higher than what I can get a loan for on my house. Uh, I, I tried refining the house. And uh, I couldn't get near what uh, what y'all were accessing uh, the the property value for. So I just think that the taxes are already high as they are, and uh, we we need to look at different ways of uh, of coming up with the money or adjusting our spending. Um, if I don't have enough money in my budget, <clears throat> I don't go to my boss and say, "Hey, I need a raise for doing the same job." I just I, I fix my budget. I, I lower what I've got to spend, and I think that that's what we need to do here. Coming from me, my taxes are already too high. And that's all I got to say. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hitt. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes. Okay, your name? Sharon Maury. I have lived here in, uh, at 8394 East Carroll Road, Plattsburgh, Georgia. I am inside Douglas County. I have lived here for 34 years. Our property taxes continue to increase. I think there's been a lot of nonsense, wasteful spending in our county. And I vote no for the property tax. Okay, are you finished? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Morey. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, my name is Sharon Hines. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It's Sharon Hines. Okay, go ahead. And I, Hi, thank you for letting me speak. And I live in the Lithia Springs area. Um, I've been here since 2005. And even with the downturn in the economy, we did not get rollbacks in our um, property tax. It has been constantly going up and up and up. And I oppose this increase in tax at this time because this is a difficult time for everyone. And I think that you guys should go back and look at your budgets and, you know, do some reconstructing of that and come up with a better solution than to raise taxes for residents in the Douglas County area. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, Chairman, I guess that's um, that will conclude the speakers. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Clerk uh, Lisa Watson. Great job and really appreciate our citizens coming in tonight uh, voicing their opinion about the proposed millage rate of 32.9%, which is uh, certainly a different proposal is on the table at this time, and I'm just not sure if all citizens are aware, are aware but certainly that information is on the website. But again, we appreciate all your comments tonight, and we certainly will continue to take a deeper dive uh, and to see what we can do to make adjustments accordingly. 
Uh, at this time, this public hearing is now closed. And uh, we certainly, Board of Commissioners, we will meet on Wednesday, uh, August the 26th, to certainly continue. I know you have another week or so to look at the budget and make decisions and massage it, and then we'll do a, we will vote accordingly um, next week, uh, which is August uh, Wednesday, August the 26th. And again, uh, thank you, citizens, for coming in, uh, especially during the sensitive moment in all of our lives regarding COVID-19. And, my, and I felt all the comments today, and it's in my heart, and I'm telling you, we have, we have worked tirelessly to get it down, and we'll continue to work to make it even better. Next, Board of Commissioners, we will move on to our new business items, and that's tab number seven. Tab number seven is authorization to mail election uh, absentee applications to all Douglas County citizens in the amount of $100,000 to, to be funded through the CARES Act. And uh, certainly, Board of Commissioners, we had an opportunity to hear in our work session yesterday, our uh, Director of uh, Elections, uh, Director Milton Kidd. So um, before I call the question, I just want to know, uh, any commissioners, do you have any, any questions for uh, Director Kidd before I move with the question, call the question? Chairman Jones? Yes, uh, Commissioner Carthen. Thank you so much for the floor. Uh, Director Kitt, can you tell us a little bit about why you are requesting um, $100,000 from the Board of Commissioners to help in the upcoming presidential election? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll begin with the statement. On March the 14th, 2020, due to the impact of COVID-19, the state of Georgia issued executive order number 3-14-20-01, declaring a public health state of emergency for Georgia. That order has now been extended through September 10th, and I believe will be extended further. In the order itself, it has the threshold for uh, communities that uh, have been impacted by COVID that are outside of the norms as having 100 positive cases per 100,000 people. Currently, Douglas County is within that threshold. To be in within that threshold allows a municipal or local government to extend a mass order requiring all of its citizens to wear a mask within public spaces. But this is illegal for elections officials to do within a polling location. So we know that uh, sending out absentee uh, ballot applications for uh, voters will remove 30, 40, possibly 50,000 people from enclosed spaces and possibly becoming vectors for transmitting COVID-19 throughout our communities. The CDC and our own Cobb uh, Douglas Health has had said one way of reducing community spread is to limit the contact with individuals in enclosed spaces. The request today will help Douglas County reduce the number of individuals that will be inside of our polling locations. Our Department of Health has just said just today that we should limit the crowd size of individuals, that doing this is a tangible step that a community can take to reduce the spread of the virus in that community. We are asking at this point for 100,000 in CARES Act funding, not coming out of the general fund, but CARES Act funding, which is funding that the federal government has directed towards state and local governments to reduce the spread and impact of the coronavirus on local governments and communities. I've outlined here today how these funds will have a direct impact on reducing the spread of COVID-19 within the Douglas County community. The threshold uh, to be in the black in cases is a hundred uh, case is under a hundred cases per a hundred thousand people. Currently, Douglas County is at two thousand eight hundred and eighty six cases, and our hospitals are full, as the the Cobb Douglas uh, Health just said today. Now, this is in uh, this is at a time frame where we are not currently in the epidemic of a flu season, which is vastly approaching on top of COVID. And people, 
No. Okay. And to put people in rooms together, not wearing masks, as though some voters will do because we cannot mandate that you actually have on a mask inside of a polling location. I feel that taking steps to reduce the number of people that will be showing up at polling locations will have a direct impact on our community. That includes the election workers who are performing their civic duty by working uh, elections. That includes other individuals that uh, will be uh, voting because it allows immunocompromised individuals and anyone in the general public to request an absentee ballot and have a ballot mailed to them in their homes. This is not a political agenda. These are active steps that we can take to save lives. That, that That's my presentation right now. Now I'll answer you. any questions. Yes. Concerns. Thank you so much, Director Kidd. One of the things that was brought up this morning that you so eloquently stated was that this is not a partisan request that both Democrats, Republicans, uh, independents, if there are any on the ballot, um, do request absentee ballots be mailed to them, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so I just wanted to push that out there because I think I heard a comment from a citizen that stated it was uh, a partisan um, request. Uh, and then one of my commissioners also stated that. So we just wanted to get that out there. I don't like dabbling in falsities. I do like factual information. That's why I'm always pushing back on things. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to ask you in regards to the $100,000 that you're requesting from the Board of, Educa Board of Commissioners under the COVID Act is, will we be having ballot boxes uh, around the county so that those individuals who still aren't uh, comfortable with mailing in their ballots, but would like to drop them off. Will those be available during this presidential election? The Douglas County right now has a plan. Douglas County right now has one ballot box outside of our main location at 8700 Hospital Drive. We also have a plan of installing four additional drop box locations throughout Douglas County one at Deer Lake Park, one at Boundary Waters Aquatic Center, one at the old uh, courthouse on Church Street, and one at Dog River Library. These are also our advanced voting locations as well, which will make these uh, convenient to voters because they're familiar with these sites. We are following all uh, the guidelines of the state of Georgia when processing absentee ballot, including actively reviewing signatures that are required to submit an absentee application and an absentee ballot. Both of those signatures are checked against uh, your voter registration rolls. They're also checked against driver services rolls. There are steps in place currently to implement what we're asking. The absentee balloting process is not a new process for the state of Georgia, so I don't want to politicize this process. These are active steps that this community can take to save lives. These are not just numbers on a page. These are our families. These are your mothers, your daughters, your sons, your brothers that are inside of polling locations, that are working these polling locations. For me, this is a personal issue. I personally know friends and uh, friends in the election space that have died because of COVID-19. Myself and my staff have been in the office we have not uh, been out of the office. We've had to be in the office because this election season has required communities to think differently about how we do elections. Previously, we were more of an, an in-person focused office, but we've had to change the way in which we conduct elections. We know that we are going into what will be the largest election in U.S. history. And to say that we don't want to be prepared for that election is a derelict of duty for myself and anyone that's associated with this election. I will say this here today. We do not have the funds currently due to the increase in participation in the elections process that could not have been uh, predicted prior to this year. I understand, Director Kidd, and my heart goes out to you regarding those individuals who did lose their lives simply by doing what they um, 
simply by going to work. And, and that I understand. And we don't want any citizens in Douglas County um, to add to the 58 that we have already lost simply because we would not mail out a ballot. Um, I, I just have one more question before I yield the floor to my colleague. Uh, we don't only mail out applications within Douglas County. There are individuals, correct me if I'm wrong, outside the county who hold Douglas County as their addresses, but who have to vote based on whether they're in the military or based on whether they are at, away at school, like my three daughters who are in college. Is that not correct? Yes, ma'am. We, uh, we mail ballots to individuals that are active duty military throughout the entire world. We also uh, mail ballots to every uh, college in the state of in the state of Georgia and out of the state of Georgia for students that are pursuing their education. This office touches more citizens of Douglas County than I would even argue any other office in the county. So if you want to have a direct impact on your citizen, this is one of the ways in which you can do it that will have a tangible impact on their lives. Because make no mistakes, we're talking about the lives of individuals when we are talking, reducing uh, the number of people that are in enclosed spaces. Our Cobb Douglas Health did a excellent presentation on today that told us one of the steps in which we can take is to reduce the number of people in enclosed spaces. This will take out the number of people in enclosed spaces. June 9th election is an indication of that. June 9th election was the first election in Douglas County history where we have had a larger absentee uh, balloting by mail process than even election day or advanced voting. So we know that uh, November 3rd is going to be in a large election. So to do nothing would be a derelict of duty on the parts of everyone. I understand. And during a presidential election, I don't know if you know offhand, what is the percentage that usually votes in the presidential election? Douglas County uh, typically averages a 73 to 75 percentile mark in a presidential election year. Douglas County citizens do vote. We vote heavier than the state average. The state average is only about a 60 to 61 percentile turnout of active registered voters. Douglas County comes out to vote. Thank you so much, Director Kidd, for answering my questions. Chairman Jones, I yield the floor. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. and I see you. Commissioner Guider, you have the floor. Yes, uh, Director Kidd, uh, first of all, I want to preference this with uh, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying it has been proven there is fraud in mail-in ballots when everybody mail-in ballots. Now, in the primary, wait a minute, in the primary, uh, the Secretary of State mailed out requests for mail-in ballots. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So you don't know what percentage of those came back to him, do you? Okay. Here's the thing. I know the exact number of ballots that uh, we had to reissue, but the Secretary of State's office had a flawed process that we are not uh, emulating here in Douglas County. That flawed process that the Secretary of State's office did, they did not issue ballots to addresses when an individual had provided a mailing address to our uh, department. They only, due to cost-cutting measures, only mailed to the address that an individual was registered at and not the mailing address. So you had some of those returned ballots that were returned because of basically a mismanagement on the um, behalf of the individuals that were managing their mail-out process. Okay, uh, let me uh, explain or have you explain. There, there is a difference in absentee ballots and just a blanket mail-out ballot to every voter, is there not? Okay, we're not blanketly mailing out absentee ballots. What we're asking here is to utilize CARES Act funding, which is which has been uh, stipulated and which the purpose of this funding is to reduce the overall impact of COVID-19. Are you mailing out ballots or requests for ballots? That's we're what doing I'm both. The initial, uh, the initial part of this is to mail out requests. 
individuals are able to complete that request for an absentee ballot and send that request back into our office. And then we're going to mail out the ballot after we verify the information on that request, verify that voter signature, that address, and all pertinent information, and then we're going to mail the ballot. So essentially, but the you're request not gonna over mail you're not going to mail out ballots to every registered voter here in Douglas County. That, that has never been the request. The request was to be able to send out absentee ballot request forms and then have voters submit those request forms to mail out ballots. Okay. Uh, so you anticipate sending out like 21? No. How many do you anticipate sending out? <laughs> Act, we're sending out uh, absentee ballot uh, request forms to all active voters. So essentially, that's 98,000 active voters. Okay. Um, when I go, uh, and you only had one drop box yes. during, during the primary, but yes. you do plan on having more drop boxes, right? Yes. Uh, I would suggest, and you mentioned boundary waters and places like that, instead of sports uh it, arenas or things like that i would suggest maybe the libraries or government buildings uh, like the tag office and 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 places that the, are more safe and the and, tag office would actually be encompassed in the area covered by the douglas county courthouse and the old courthouse. The reason why we chose the places which we chose because those are typically our advanced voting locations as well. So voters are familiar with the layout of these locations. But there are a myriad of requirements that the, the state requires for us to uh, uh, place a drop box in a location, including it has to be a government-owned uh, building. You have to have video surveillance, which you have access to. You have to secure the box with a specific fashion. I won't go into all the security measures, but uh, these decisions were not made in a vacuum. These were consulting uh, with the Secretary of State's office to come up with the best uh, plan to service the majority of Douglas County citizens in the most efficient and effective manner possible. Okay, now, uh, when um, when I go in to vote, and I just go in, and I, ha I go to the machine after I've registered and everything, that machine counts that vote immediately, right? No, ma'am. At the end of the day, it's, that machine's not added up with all the other machines. No, ma'am. Okay, the process here in Georgia now, uh, if you voted since uh, since the June the 9th election and uh, before with the presidential election in March, the state of Georgia changed voting system. We have gone to what's called a BMD voting system. Essentially, that machine that you're making your choices on is called a ballot marking device. A ballot marking device prints uh, the ballot for you, and then you take that ballot over to a scanner. That scanner then scans in that uh, ballot, so we retain the paper copy of that ballot. We retain a digital image of that ballot in that ballot scanner. So, so essentially, once, it, first once it's scanned in, is it counted at that point? We're, we're going to run out of time. You're it, it's not counted at that point. It is tabulated at that point. That ballot is officially not counted until it gets back to our office and we uh, go through the but actual It's not counted at that precinct at that point. Is it's, what I'm scanned, saying. it's scanned at that precinct, but it's not counted at that uh, particular time. Okay. If I mail in a ballot, when I mail in a ballot, someone's got to open the envelope, check the signature, pull out anything that doesn't look right, and then scan it. So that's yes. uh, about a lot of handling uh, as far as the, the people are concerned. Yes, but the, the concern is that when you mail out ballots, I don't know what list you're using. Are you using the one from the Secretary of State file or your, your yeah. own independent? As I stated before, the entire... Just thing, answer my question, because I see we're getting... We're yes, running I'm, a, I'm answering time. your question. The state of Georgia sure. has... The state of Georgia has an election uh, system that we maintain voters' information. The state of Georgia, when they initially did their mail-out, did not mail to people's 
uh, mailing addresses. They had uh, that information, but they ch chose not to mail out to people's uh, mailing addresses as a cost-cutting measure. Okay. And we're not Do you have that. your own list yes. that you're going to mail out to? Okay. And um, now I I worked in the tax office for 36 years, and I can assure you, if you can mail out 98,000 uh, ballots. There's going to be a whole bunch of them. That's, we're, that, we're not mailing minute, out ballots. Please let me answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, a change of address with the post office is only good for about six months. So if there, anybody has moved since then, or they did not file a change of address, that ballot could be uh, delivered to someone's house. This is one of the arguments about the mail-out ballots. When you say and, and the more ballots you mail out, the worse it's going to be. When you but, send uh, a absentee ballot, part of the process is to verify okay. the signature and the information of every ballot. We have every voter's signature on file. Okay. Uh, when you when you did the mail out this past uh, primary, how many were returned to you? Undeliverable by the we post. We had 200, uh, 230 ballots returned. As and these are people that requested ballots, right? This is essentially the same process. The absentee ballot applications went out and they uh, requested ballots. The reason why you can't use a blanket statement, people's ballots are returned by the post office for a myriad of reasons, including some people after they did the initial request, they uh, have stopped their mail. And they moved. They they moved, moved, like I stated before. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know if you're familiar with Portland, uh, New Jersey. Uh, there was an election that uh, the, they found uh, ballots all over the floor. People were arrested in the elections bureau and the uh, candidates that won the city council because it was all fraudulent. And they, they got a big black eye. So it does happen. And Every this part is, of our is the integ uh, excuse mm -hmm. me. The, the integrity of the vote is crucial. Yes, ma'am. Either party. And, yes, ma'am. And I'm just saying, uh, when I said something about party lines, I'm saying the Democrats do want mail out votes, no ballots to everybody. And the Republicans did not. That's, That's not what we're asking here. Well, someone Milton, did, Milton. Someone did um, say, tell me, because I, I tried to verify this today. Someone told me that these were going to be ballots, not requests for ballots. I can assure you the initial part is the request. And as far as the signatures and things like that, all of our processes here are open. We had, during the June 9th election, we had representatives of both political parties that were present during the opening of ballots, during the scanning of ballots. These actions are also open to the general public that are encouraged to participate in every part of our elections process. Everything that we do is open to the public and for public scrutiny. Well, the, uh I just uh, worry about the integrity of the vote. It's not political because I don't care whether I'm Republican or Democrat or whatever. I want the vote to be as uh, current, current and accurate as possible. And everybody should have the same concern about that. So, and I'm not pointing fingers at you, but I am saying there's a lot of instances uh, like in New Las Vegas, where they, they, the post office didn't even deliver them to uh, the P.O. box. There's a lot of question about whether or not the post office are going to be able to handle it. But Georgia does not require a um, postmark, a required date, a postmark. The laws in the state of Georgia require that absentee ballots be back into our office, not postmarked, but back into the election's custody by 7 p.m. on election night. I will say this, too, though. 
speaking for myself, I have been essentially part of uh, Douglas County for the last five years. And under this administration and the previous administration, I've also been the individual that administered the absentee balloting process, including uh, the election in which you have uh, previously run in. I don't, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what you're implying. Uh, I'm not saying, and as I preference this to begin with, I wasn't pointing any fingers at you. I'm just saying there has been a lot of instances where there has been some fraud. If you remember Broward County, Florida, they found all kinds of ballots sitting around in the office after the vote and everything. So it does happen. So, uh, and that's my main concern is the integrity, but if you're not, the list that you've got, you had to get from the Secretary of State. Did no, ma'am, we maintain, the Secretary of State pulls the voter files. You, and you, can, rec county you can register to vote online at the Secretary of State's office. When you register online, that is sent to the county. All registration activities have to go through the county office. The Secretary of State pulls their list from the county. So that online registration feeds into the county, and then myself or a member of my staff verify the information too. And one, one quick um, question. Are you going to mail out anything to the 200 that was already returned undeliverable? We are required by law to any absentee ballots that we do not that we do not count for any reason whatsoever. We're required to send them notification. We have done that for the previous election. Yes, ma'am. So you are going to mail them out to we, the two hundred. I'm sorry. I'm, we've we've mailed uh, part part of rejecting any absentee ballot for any reason is to send a rejection notification to that voter. We have uh, sent those rejection notifications outlining what happened with that individual's ballot. We did send those to those 200 people, yes. And you got responses? Uh, we have uh, responses. That in most cases, individuals at this point have taken to update their voter registration, have corrected issues that they have. Voters have until October the 5th for the current election season to make any changes to their accounts. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, I, I, I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. I hope you got up. Uh, you receive clarification. And I do see uh, our, our attorney Bernard has his hand up and then I'm gonna call the question if no other commissioner has anything to contribute to the discussion. Thank you so much again, uh, Director Kidd. Uh, attorney Bernard, I know you have, you wanna chime in and then I'm gonna call the question. Yeah, M Madam Chair, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, uh, I wanna make sure it's clear what has been vetted. First of all, before it came to us, Milton reached out to the Secretary of State office who blessed his request saying that was no law to the contrary that prohibited a ballot an absentee ballot application request form being sent out there's no provision milton reached out to us and we also independently verified georgia law is silent as to the request that milton has but georgia law is not silent as to Milton cannot just send out an absentee ballot. That's not what he's requesting. What he's requesting, as I understand it, what's been vetted by legal, is that he be given funds to send out to his registered voters the ballot absentee request application. So if the board were to use its discretion and do that, which is up to the board, then when he sends those out, when they come out, he has to go through a legal check before he can actually release an absentee ballot by mail, whether it be a college student out of town, whether it be somebody in the military, whether it be somebody down the street. So we've talked back and forth about ballots. What Milton is asking for is permission to, uh, and funding under the CARES Act to send out ballot application requests, absentee ballot application requests to the registered voter list. And I just want to make sure that's clear. He's not sending out, nor can he legally just send out ballots to everybody. 
he is sending out the request form, which then has to be vetted. I just want to make sure that's clear. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Bernard. Are you, are you finished? Okay. Yes, ma'am. And I think Milk can verify what I just said. Yes, sir. That is correct. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Milton, for your contributions. And I just wanted to make a statement before we go. When I, when we, uh, when the commissioners are questioning our, our directors, and I, they answered and respond so eloquently and so uh, responsibly. I, I appreciate that. But I just want to let y'all know that we, uh, for the directors, we don't, we're not trying to intimidate you. They just have questions. And thank you all so much for working so hard. I really appreciate all the hard work that our directors do. And so when it's your moment to deliver, I just wanted to make sure that you all understand. It's just questions that the board is asking and they, they're really, uh, they're questions that are very meaningful to them and they're just trying to get, uh, gain clarification. I do see our uh, Commissioner Mitchell's hand is up. Commissioner Mitchell. Uh, Director Ted, thank you, Madam Chair. Director Ted, just, just a couple of, we're not gonna go through that whole dissertation, but we'll, just a couple of questions here though. The cost yes, of $100,000, that's just a rough estimate of not only making the request to those voters that may or may not want to receive an absentee ballot or not, or they can still come in, they can make the request of getting receiving the information of the 90 something plus that you send it out to and they could actually come in and just still vote. You know, uh, they don't have to take this uh, direction, correct? But that's, yes, the sir. First, that's the first part of the question. So is that correct? Yes, sir, you are correct. Okay, so with that, we, we're estimating at $100,000 of the need. How did you derive to that number of $100,000? And if you don't use the entire $100,000, I'm assuming that'll be returned back uh, to the county based on the mere fact of you only use half of it because let's say half of the population decided to, to want the absentee ballot, correct? Or just help me formulate that though. Yes, sir. Uh, any funds uh, that are not, well, these funds will specifically be used for the purposes outlined and any funds that are not used for that as far as individuals not requesting ballots and things like that will be returned to the county. Right, right. Okay. So that's what I kind of thought. So this is not, and I know this is kind of an, an estimate and you're basing it off of a couple of elections prior to and with this pandemic with those who probably would rather, which I'm one of the candidates who prefer to just vote from where I live and send it back into you guys. So um, and that's that's where you're getting this number from or how did you derive to that number? Though? Yes, sir. That's uh, derived using previous election data as far as getting uh, information from companies that are available to produce this mail out. So it, it's a combination of all of those issues. And to include the stamp and all that good stuff. Okay. Yes, sir. Life. Yeah, my, my last question though with the BOE. Okay, what is the BOE recommending? And I'm assuming you're speaking on behalf of the BOE as to kind of they prefer we take this route or they prefer not to spend this $100,000 estimate of doing this. Yes, sir. Although all departments had serve at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners, I also have a Board of Elections and Registration, mm -hmm. which uh, held a duly elected vote to uh, ask myself to present to the Board of Commissioners this line uh, of uh, inquiry as far as sending out these absentee ballot requests and securing these funds. So essentially, yes, it is the Board of Elections and Registration that is asking this. I'm asking on their behalf. Got it. And that's all I wanted to make sure that the general public understand that this is just not a pie in the sky request. Uh, you vetted it and you kind of went through the process to assure that what we're trying to pull off, there's a true reason behind it and there's a method to all of this as to why we're doing this. So it's just not you just wanting to spend $100,000 of uh, care at funds or, or any funds, but just want to make sure that the, the general public understands this is not something that we just want to do is something that we think makes sense based on the COVID-19 and, and the, and the, and, and the state requirement and the COVID-19 or, or the CDC uh, layout as to kind of what that process should look like. And basically to assure that we got the social distancing going on and we, you know, we're protecting those poll workers and so on, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, any request that uh, I initially make to you all has been previously vetted by the Board of Elections and Registration and essentially blessed and voted on by this active body as well. 
Well, you've done well. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. Appreciate it. And I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell, and thank you so much, uh, Director Kidd. Very good job, and thank you for explaining everything so eloquently for us, because now uh, the citizens, I believe, have a very good understanding, and certainly COVID-19 is not going away anytime soon, uh, and uh, we need uh, to protect our citizens as best as possible in this moment. So appreciate all the work that you're doing. All right, thank you so much. Thank All right, you. Board of Commissioners, I'm going to call the question. If there are no more comments, the question is, Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to approve to, to approve um, mail election absentee applications to all Douglas County citizens in the amount of $100,000 to be funded through the CARES Act? So moved. Second. We have a motion in a second. Any discussion? We have a motion in a second. Please, when I call your name, please indicate your response. District 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell III. District 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell III. Oh, yes. Okay. District 2, uh, Commissioner and Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson. Yes. Okay. District 3, Commissioner Tarinia Carthen. District 3, Tarinia Carthen votes yes. Okay. District 4, Ann jones Skyder. Commissioner Ann jones Skyder, District 4, no. Okay. Chairman, Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones, my answer is yes. So we have a 4-0, I mean a 4-1 uh, vote and the motion carries. All right, Board of Commissioners, thank you so much. And we'll move on to tab number eight. Tab number eight is authorization to approve $200,000 of CARES Act funding for the Elevate Douglas COVID-19 business grant. And certainly, Board of Commissioners, before I call the question, I'm hoping that Mr. Chris Pumphrey is on the line. Okay. Yes, I am here. I'm okay. here just trying to get my mic on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Chris, if you could explain to the Board of Commissioners what this request is about as, uh, again, you are working in tandem with other uh, uh, organizations to see what we can do to support our small businesses at a time such as this, who we realize that the small businesses are the heartbeat of our community. So with no further ado, Chris Pomfrey, our Executive Director of Development, uh, Economic Development, you have the floor. Thank, thank you all. And uh, just as I, uh, you know, presented yesterday and, and Madam Chair uh, described, uh, this is an opportunity for us to utilize um, the CARES Act funding to be a direct uh, financial support to uh, small businesses from sole proprietors to up to those with up to 25 employees um, who have been adversely affected uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 public health pandemic. Um, this is a public-private partnership um, between uh, the Development Authority, the Douglas County Economic Development Authority, the Douglas County Chamber, uh, Google, Switch, um, and, uh, and requests made to the Douglas County Board of Commissioners and the Douglasville City Council. Uh, the council will take, up, take it up at their September 3rd and September 8th meetings um, and with consensus around the, two, the same amount of $200,000. Okay. Any questions from the board before I call the question, Chris, or comments? Okay. With that being said, Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to approve authorization of $200,000 of CARES Act funding for the Elevate Douglas COVID-19 business grant to support our small businesses here in Douglas County? Let me to try it again. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to approve authorization of $200,000 of CARES Act funding for the Elevate Douglas COVID-19 business grant? Okay. The motion actually fails for a lack, it, it, it actually fails for a lack of a motion. All right. Board of Commissioners. 
So, uh, Executive Director, I did not get a motion on this at all. So, uh, certainly it fails at this time, but not saying that it, it, it is not one that could be brought back to the Board of Commissioners. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. All right, Board of Commissioners, we're going to move into our consent agenda. Our consent agenda at this time is um, tab number nine, authorization to submit the FY 2020 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant JAG application in the amount of $13,414, which is no match, and allow for 30-day public comment uh, period and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Tab number 10, authorization to approve a contract with West uh, West Publishing uh, Corporation for the purchase of the West Law Research Software in the amount of uh, $2,457 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents uh, subject to final legal review. Tab number 11, authorization to approve a right of way of easement for Greystone Power Corporation in order to run power to the new concession stand at Billock Park as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Tab number 12, authorization to approve a right of way easement for Georgia Power in order to run an underground line to set the needed transformer for the new senior center as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Tab number 13, approval of the name for the new senior center as South Sweetwater Senior Activity Center as recommended by the Parks and Recreation <laughs> Oversight Committee. Tab number 14, authorization to advertise for a public hearing to consider amending the Douglas County Code of Ordinances to adjust package retail Sunday alcohol sales of malt beverages and wine to begin 11 a.m. and end at 12 midnight pursuant to the House Bill 879, which went into a, a law on August 3rd, 2020. Tab number 15, authorization to approve a license agreement with the Douglas County School System for the use of the county system radio, uh, uh, the county radio system and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. And tab number 16 is approval to amend the 2020 budget to reflect the following, a general, uh, general fund revenue cut of $11,600,000 dollars and of six hundred thousand um three hundred and seventy five dollars uh general fund expense cut two million nine hundred and nineteen thousand three hundred and sixty six dollars and a general fund net impact of eight million six hundred eighty one thousand nine dollars other funds affected uh that's been um in this amendment would be unincorporated uh unincorporated areas special district fund expense cut thirty three thousand seven hundred and eighty dollars Fire and EMS fund expenses cut $116,825 and animal control fund expenses cut $77,546. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Madam. Go ahead. So moved. Okay, we have so moved. Second, we have a motion and a second. And I any discussion on any particular item? Madam Chair, this is Mark Till. May I speak? Yes, County Administrator, you may. Yes, uh, according to it's my understanding from talking with Consuela today, the it should be uh, activity center instead of activities. Okay. Activ um, I believe it's item number 13. Okay, activity center. Okay, thank you. So noted, Madam Chair. Beg your pardon? I Please. said so noted based on the motion that the yes. adjustment was made. Thank you. We've already made it. And clerk, I, I know you've taken, you've um, received the change and I hope you've made a note of the, the revision. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on any particular topic, Board of Commissioners, or any particular um, number? We have a motion and a second. Chairman uh, Jones. Yeah, Commissioner Carthen. Okay, thank you. I think I was sharing my screen because I was trying to get to the um, 
the Board of Commissioners Commission adjusted item request. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question regarding us voting on this. So, Cam, we have uh, Sabrina, if she's available, to kind of go over what we're voting on. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Sabrina. Hey, you hi, Board. Good mm -hmm. evening. I know it's been a long day, so I will try and let me pull it up real quick so you can see it on my screen. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Okay. So the way um, it's in the agenda packet is the summary. Can everybody see my screen before I get started? Oh, it looks like it's John presenting. Yes, we can, can see it. Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, it was the breakdown by department, which is um, this right here, and it has the breakdown by department, and then it's color coded by function. And then it, the total is 2.9 million, but just to kind of explain what these cuts are, it's what's already built into the dashboard um, that David Corbin set up with us with cash flows. It is removing all remaining BIRs. It is removing the savings for the open positions and freezing them for the remainder of the year. And it's removing most of the training. And then on top of that, it is cuts from other departments. Mark um, had reached out to all of his departments and they all were very um, receptive and they came back with uh, good cuts. And then Madam Chair also spoke to some of the elected officials as well. So these are all, the departments are all aware of these and feel confident they can make these numbers. And it actually ended up being $4 million in cuts. But the reason why it got brought down was in general appropriations. We went ahead and added in the additional expense to get to the required amount for the DB, not the recommended. If the board so chooses uh, to closer to the end of the year, they can obviously amend it. But right now we knew we had to pay the required, so that was included. So that's why it dropped from $4 million in cuts to the 2.9. And then the revenue cuts, it's $11.6 million. It's just kind of recording the shortfalls. And that's basically the lost fund. It's about it's taken out around five million to keep it flat from July through December, which will just remain as the same as last year. And so taking out you know that internet tax sales and then just the growth of the economy that we're not experiencing. Um, TABT, it's taking out two point seven million. That's estimating three hundred and fifty thousand per month for July through December. And again, that's just with the economy that kind of goes hand in hand so there's a reduction there and then as well as on July 1st the House Bill 779 had passed a law uh, transferring the percentages from the cities to the counties the counties and Board of Education were seeing dramatic increases in the TAVT and the um, cities were seeing extreme losses so they flipped our percentages to correct that but again that's just for any purchases within the incorporated areas uh, we had to adjust intergovernmental revenues. The main thing there was that 500000 for the SROs since the Board of Education is opening up their own um, uh, police force. We're not going to be receiving that revenue anymore. And we've obviously adjusted it on the expense side with the open position, so we had to do it on the revenue side. Uh, charges for services, we had to reduce that by about a half a million. As everyone knows, parks and recs, libraries, Connect Douglas fees, all of that has went down dramatically. I know we do refund requests every day, especially for parks and rec, as programs get canceled or people you know, might not feel comfortable having their children enrolled. Uh, courts and law enforcement were uh, budgeting that down 1.5 million just due to the limited court operations where it's trending. And then also the miscellaneous, we had to take out 500,000 because when we removed the Douglas County Sheriff's Office BIRs for their, um, the lease for their patrol cars and the equipment, the sheriff had agreed to give 500,000 to go towards that. So that was included in our revenue. And then just to kind of give a summary per fund. So the amended budget that was presented at the July or yesterday's finance committee, which is ending 731, our revenues were 101.6 million. This uh, cut is bringing them down 11.6. That's going to get to about 90 million. You can see that right here. The expenditures, which does include the 5.8 million transfers out of Fire EMS, is 110.8. And then it's going to reduce the expenses 2.9, bringing us to 107.8. And that's where we were getting that 10% number where we changed it. And so that's kind of showing you the amended one. 
Uh, for the unincorporated, it was going to revenues from 11.25. They're staying the same. We only touched um, expenses. So they're going from almost 10.6 to, it's not, theirs isn't that much, it's 33,000. So it's really the same. Mm -hmm. uh, fire protection, and that's a smaller fund too. They don't have a lot. Um, fire protection service and EMS, it's 16.9, and that's re reducing it 116,000 to get it to about 16.6. .6. Animal control, they're going from 1.6 or 1.7 to 1.6. And if any of the board has any questions about the details among these departments, I have the detail on every general ledger account of what the breakdown is, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you so much, Sabrina. So I am assuming that all of the revenues and the amended um, items um, are committed to by each department. We, we have it and it, it is committed to. And so once we amend it tonight, this will be the budget for 2020. This will be the amended budgeted items for 2020. That is correct. And what would that total um, budget be? It'll be the expenses for the general fund will be right here. It's going to be the $107,893,718. Okay. And on one of the, um, one of my questions, I know Commissioner, uh, Chairman Jones called me about the healthcare um, claims and expenses. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? I think it was, she said it was a million or so that yeah. we're just that's actually not a part of this that okay. is separate regarding the millage rate okay so but this right here is the budget that we are accepting tonight if if the board so chooses and this is irrelevant of whether we don't increase or increase that's correct okay this is just kind of getting us to the baseline numbers that david corbin's been presenting him mm -hmm. and Jennifer uh, worked to re-estimate the figures based off how we were seeing things projecting and then just working out to departments and making as many cuts as we could. And that's all this is reflective on. So this revenue number right here is mm -hmm. what the budgeted revenue is. It has, once the board does adopt a millage rate, if it is an increase above the 10.213, at that point, we'd have to do a second budget amendment to show the increased revenue at that point. Understood. Um, so first off, I want to thank you. And I also want to thank the departments, um, who, uh, I think just educating the public, they think that the board of commissioners, uh, does the budget and tell people what to spend, but we don't, we actually have to trust our elected officials. We have to trust our department heads and we have to trust that what they put in their budget is what they need in order to give the services and provide um, all of the things that the county government does. So this this relationship for a board of commissioner um, is a trust situation uh, in regards to all of these departments. And I think we have 28 departments and, and you know, eight or nine elected officials who bring us their budgets. Uh, so I commend those who went back, who looked at their coffers and said, hey, we're going to come to the table and here is what we can do in order to help meet the needs so all of it won't be on the backs um, of the taxpayers. So kudos to all of my elected officials and to all of those department heads who I've reached back. My only question uh, is the $116,825 um, expenditure that we're taking from the fire department. Uh, could that not be included in the CARES Act? Did we have to take that? Uh, I can pull up what that was for. I believe that was, let's see. So I think this is just reductions they found. It looks like in their operating. It had, it wasn't no. related to COVID expenses. Okay. Got you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. I thank you for that explanation and, and hopefully some of the, the constituents who were on earlier um, are, are hearing this. Uh, you know, we don't just come up with numbers out of the sky. These are actual people. These are actual departments. These are actual elected officials who have budgets to carry out the, the services of this county. Uh, no one is spending money frivolously because government doesn't have money to spend frivolously. We're not a private corporation, so there is no stock and pile of resources and money. The only way, and I say this all the time, is for the county to get money is through sales tax and property taxes. Uh, any other revenue sources that, uh, you know, is, is derived 
is uh, is kind of out of our control um, once those uh, things are, are given to those departments for their budgets. But uh, thank you so much. And with that, Chairman Jonas, I yield. OK, thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. All right, with that being said, we have a motion and a second. When I call your name for the consent Madam agenda, Chair, please. Yeah. I, I hear someone. Madam Chair, that will be Commissioner oh, Mitchell. OK, I'm sorry. I, I okay. could barely hear you, Commissioner Mitchell. Okay. Is, is that better? Am I? Yeah, I can minute. hear you now. Yeah, okay. seems like right. you were way far off. OK. OK, yeah, OK. Uh, so just a couple of questions, though, I've, I've got. Um, so the, um, can you pull back up the slide, not you, Madam Chair, um, can you pull back up the slide, the, um, the five day furlough, how much was that, was it like about seven something or help me out here? Oh, that, the that. five days, um, and that's not, that's just built in on the digest. This is, this budget amendment is separate, but I can pull that up. I don't think that's much. Okay, so these numbers that we're looking at and what we're talking about now, does that take us to the end of the year or this, this is for 2021? Make sure I'm, I'm, I'm thinking along the same line of what, what, we're, what, we're, what I'm looking at here. This is for 2020. And okay. these, like I said, are just the original numbers where David oh. has up here, but it didn't include um, the furloughs. That will be something that if the board so chooses, once they adopt the millage rate, that'll be something additional to 723. And the five days was estimated at 723,857. And again, just to clarify, that's five days for 40 hour employees, but since sh uh, Sheriff works yep. 12 hour shifts and fireworks 24 hours, theirs is gonna be a little different to make it fair. Mm -hmm. So um, theirs would be, fire will be two days and Sheriff would be three, or the 12 hour shifts within the Sheriff. But it'll total up to be five days. Yes, yeah, the hours are pretty much, I mean, it's not 100%, but it's as close as we can get rounding um, the, for their shifts. And, and and where are the contract employees in this? For, for They're included. Mm -hmm. The only people not included in this furlough are elected officials because your salary is set by law. Got it, okay. So with the contract employees, it came up to that number of seven, and I apologize, it's kind of small, I can't see oh, it. I'm sorry, seven, 723,857. Got it, okay, okay. All righty, um, and I guess I'll defer to Ken and legal with that, with the five day furlough, Ken, this is legal, we are okay to pull this off and get to the end of the year, correct? <coughs> Can you, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, uh, I will tell you that all the uh, annual contracts for employees that are under contract have a provision in them for, I believe, Mark, up to 10 days of furlough during a 12-month calendar year of those contracts. That's what I would say publicly. Gotcha. So, so we're saying five and over here in August. That's where it may get a little tricky, I guess. And I don't know if that's the question for you, uh, Ken, or, or that we a question for Mark. Well, I, I think that the, the, the contract has a provision for up to 10 days of furlough, and it does not specify when they can be taken. And so uh, assuming they're all in the same year, which we've tried to align all the contracts to begin and end on the same date. Mm -hmm. So the, my hesitancy is not to hide anything. Is What I don't know is... I think it might be problematic for somebody that had a contract that was dated late in the year for whatever reason. It's just finishing out to de December 31st, but I think that's very few and probably none. But all the regular contracts that y'all routinely approved annually and are reviewed and left in Mark's notebook for your annual review, they all have the same provision about an up to 10 day furlough. So my hesitancy is not to create suspicion, it's just to say, I, I can't tell you how the X number of contracts, there might be two or three or four or six that are slightly twerked because of some uh, timing issue. But I believe that that represents 99% of all your annual contracts, 99% plus. Is that fair? I, I, I'm with you. I, I just wanted to kind of be stated publicly that, you know, as yeah. Senator Carson stated, that we just want to make sure that the general public understand and see all the 
the numbers and see all the possibilities and see all the stuff. So that's, that's I mean, well stated. Yeah. Um, my other question, okay, Ken, thank you. My other question is the CARES Act uh, funds and all this. Are, are any of these funds uh, in relation to the CARES Act? Uh, no, sir. These this budget amendment is separate from the CARES Act. Just want to make these sure. are just additional. I mean, it, some of it does fall in line. The departments had lowered operations, were able to reduce, you know, certain lines due to the pandemic and limited operations. But with this being a reduction expenses, it, it doesn't have. We're not right now. The way the millage rate's being presented to you all is that that CARES Act funding is just getting put back in the general fund with the exception of the 900,000 resolution and then any of the two items that were voted on today. Um, everything else is being assumed that is being absorbed within each department's budget unless the board chooses otherwise if the second phase comes along, which we're hoping it does and ACCG feels confident we'll get that. So so as, as to my question, that, that some of these funds are associated with the CARES Act. Well, it's, I mean, I guess technically you could say yeah, it's not going to be anything we can ask for reimbursement to the CARES Act. It's just their operation, some of these departments, their operations have limited, or exact training example. We have pretty much minimized training to zero with the exception of obviously sheriff and then fire and EMS because even as part of their training budget, like I know sheriff is bullet. So but other departments, anybody who had training, pretty much it's all been canceled through the year. We're not meeting training, in person, but, or it's not done But training has nothing to do with the CARES Act. I don't think training would yeah. even. No. Yeah. Well, yes. So I, this, I think what what she means, some of these some of these decreases, Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. Are due to the coronavirus, not the CARES Act. Okay. So. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the the numbers are lower because because operations. They weren't able to spend some of the funds due to the coronavirus. But that being said, you can't use those losses to get reimbursed from the CARES Act. Right. So okay. these are really not, so these are just decreases in their budget that they are able to absorb. See, but it has no, is, they're not reimbursable from the CARES Act. Got it. See, my fear is that CARES Act that we're so laying our hat on. And, and trying to assure that that's the way out and that's the way we can balance our budget is not the best uh, recommendation for me because that's not 100% guaranteed. And I know ACCG has talked about just put it all on there. Let's just, hey, put it out there and let's see if we get it. I just don't know if that's going to be the way out. But at least, uh, you know, thanks for the, the correction. And, and, and I think I understand a little bit better as to what this is. And we'll kind of deal with that you know, on the next round of this, uh, the vote, but um, we'll we'll kind of see what that does, I guess. See. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner, you did you yield back or? Commissioner? Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Commissioner Robinson. And I saw Commissioner Guider's hand before yours, uh, Commissioner. I can go last. Okay, Commission, uh, Commissioner Guider, I saw your hand. Yes, uh, and I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, someone was, I think it was Tiffany, talking about HR 6800 before the Hills Act, which uh, reimburses cities and counties and states for loss of revenue. What happened with that legislation? Is it still pending or is it dead? Yes, Commissioner Gardner, this is a Tiffany Stewart standing. Yes, the legislation is still pending. Um, I, as you know, the Senate, they left. And uh, right now, I don't think they're coming back until September. So negotiations kind of fell through for the Heals Act. Um, and so we're just waiting to see if those negotiations will continue when they come back. Okay, I knew the House was in recess and they'd been called back, but you're saying the Senate, this is a, a House bill. Well, HR. Uh, uh, no, um, so the HEROES Act is HR 6800, but the Hills Act, that's a compilation of different Republican bills in the Senate. And like I said, the 
Hills Act is, like I said, they are they are on recess, the, the U.S. Senate, and they're supposed so, to come back in September. So we might still get some reimbursement of loss revenue because of the uh, shutdown. Yes, ma'am. There is still a, there, that is still an option. Nothing has been decided right now. All right. I just wanted to find out what the standing of that bill was. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guider, um, Vice Chairman, um, Commissioner Kelly Robinson. All right. Yes, I'll try to wrap this up. I know you're already in a motion in a second. So mm -hmm. one question, Sabrina. In the Finance Committee on Monday, you came down $3 million in expenses and $9 million down, down in um, revenues. So, and you gave me a number. So I'm going to ask you publicly now, what's our new number? What's the the new amended number for revenues is ninety million sixty one thousand nine hundred and fifty for the general fund, and then the expenditures is one hundred and seven million eight hundred and ninety three thousand and seven hundred and eighteen. Right. And again, that number includes the five point eight million transfers out to fire and EMS. Sometimes it's presented to you all where we take it out because it when you're doing transfers, it's coming out of one fund and getting brought into the other. So. It does get confusing, but for the budget amendment, I think it's important it gets left in because that's how it's going to be shown in the finance committee. Okay. So what's the difference between 107 and 90 point some change? 17.8 million. All right. All right. So that's our number? Yeah, that's the excess deficiency of revenues over expenditures. I mean, under expenditures. Okay. So to my peers, are y'all paying attention? That's 17 million. You can call it whatever you want to. There's a long way to get to this point. Like, uh huh. All right. How much is a meal worth? 4.9 million. All right. So four, five million, five times five gets me to the three. That's three and some change. But I know you got some some moves coming. All right. Now, now I know this has been a long day. This thing has moved twice. Um, obviously, probably most of us haven't even had a chance to break from. Um, what we do um, when we're not in session. So I know we all need to go away and print all these printouts like the public and get our minds around this, but don't pay attention, guys. Pay attention, she just told you what the number is. After all that, did you hear the number just for this budget? Okay, that's all I gotta say, Madam Chair, I'm going to you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner. Board of Commissioners, we have a motion and a second on the floor. We have a motion and a second, please, when I call your district, and I'll start from District 4 and work up just to be do something different. District 4, Commissioner Ann Guider. Yes. District 3, Commissioner Terenia Carthen. District 3, Commissioner Terenia Carthen, yes. District 2, and Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson. Yeah, Kelly Robinson, District 2, yes. District 1, Henry Mitchell the third. Commissioner Mitchell. Mark, is Commissioner Mitchell still here on the line with us? Okay, well, I'll I'm move looking. on. Okay. No, I do not see him. Okay. Ramona Jackson Jones, uh, Chairman of the Board of Commissioners, yes. Uh, can you see if you could make sure he didn't? I think that may be him. I'm not sure. See if that's him, Mark. Uh, see if that's Commissioner Mitchell. That's him. He's trying to get back in. <laughs> okay. You can pause. I will wait. Yep, he just left. So hold on. Maybe he's coming back. No, that's, I'm, I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We can, yeah, we can hear you now. I thought, okay, Commissioner, I've, I've already uh, have all the districts uh, votes in. It's, and then uh, I've already voted. I'm just waiting on your response for the consent agenda. Okay, Commissioner Mitchell, District 1 vote yes. Okay, we have a 5 vote, uh, unanimous vote, and the motion carries. All right, thank you all so much, Board of Commissioners. And then we're going to move on to the approval of our expenses. Board of Commissioners, I know you had an opportunity to look at your expenses. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
We have a motion and a second. Please indicate when I'll call your district and just with your response. District one, Commissioner. Commissioner Mitchell, uh, district one, yes. District two, Commissioner. Kelly Robinson, district two, yes. District three, Commissioner. Terania Carthen, district three, yes. District four, Commissioner. Yes. Okay, Commissioner and Guider, thank you. And uh, the Chairman Ramona Jackson Jones, yes. We have a 5 0 unanimous vote, and the motion carries, Board of Commissioners. Thank you so much. Next, we have our announcements from our um, own director. But before I ask uh, Board of Commissioners, do you have any special announcements or any special events coming up that you would like to chime in and, and, and announce to our citizens before I call on our Director of uh, Communications? Ma'am. Yes, Commissioner Guider. Um, I had a taxpayer tell me that they went to the um, assessor's office to file an appeal according to the deadline that was uh, out there, and no one was there. Um, we need to know, are they open? Uh, because people are filing their appeals. I understand that it's been extended to the 27th, I think, August the 27th. But this taxpayer didn't know it, and all the other taxpayers may, they might need to know that they still have time to appeal their taxes. <laughs> but the offices, when I was in there getting a, a tag not too long ago, there was a, a note on the elevator that they were closed. So I just thought it was kind of odd preparing the digest and everything why they're closed. Uh, are they closed just to the public? But to take appeals, you have to have somebody take appeals because most of the time the people want their paperwork date stamped to show that they did file that appeal. So uh, the, I think TJ had mentioned that he had some information about it. This would be a great time to share that, TJ. <laughs> Okay, are you finished, Commissioner, so I can chime yes, in? Okay, uh -huh. thank you. All right, um, first of all, Mark, if you could just follow up with our uh, Board of Assessors, our County Administrator will follow up with them to make sure that we have clear clarity on the dates. And I believe, and, and you are correct, Commissioner Guider, uh, TJ did mention that uh, it, there has been a, an extension. I'm just, uh, certainly I will pose the question to our Director of Communications to make sure, is that information available on our website for the Citizens uh, Director of Communications? Yes, Madam Chair, it is. Okay. Front, just front page of the website under latest news. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So Commissioner Guider, I hope that satisfies you and then uh, our County Administrator will follow up with our tax assessors to make sure. So we definitely want to be available to our citizens who have uh, a desire to uh, certainly a file an appeal. My concern oh, wait, is Madam Chair, tax and I'm waiting to hear back. No, it's been extended. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, but it's available. It's out there that it's been uh, uh, extended. Well, not everybody looks at the website. <laughs> I know. Um, we posted on social media as well. We'll add it on to Happenings e-newsletter, Madam Chair, uh, which goes out this Thursday at 7 a.m. We can uh, add it there as well, and that is our plan. And find out if the office is open because it was not open on the deadline. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Uh, Communications Director, you have the floor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just want to announce that the Board of Commissioners will be holding a special call meeting, another one, for the final public hearing regarding the millage rate on Wednesday, August 26th. That's at 10 a.m. Uh, the meeting will be broadcasted virtually. DCTV23 and streamlined on DCTV23.com, Facebook happenings page as well. Public is invited for public comment. Citizen, citizens may register to speak at the uh, public hearing uh, with the county clerk, uh, Ms. Lisa Watson. Her email is on our website, celebratedouglascounty.com. Uh, those um, who are unable to email her can call her by phone at 770-920-7416. Again, that is 770-920-7416. Uh, 
Uh, moving on, the Communications and Community Relations Department through our Programming Committee uh, has decided to produce four virtual September Saturdays. Saturday shows in celebration of September Saturdays virtually uh, instead of our traditional way on the courthouse grounds in light of our pandemic uh, and COVID-19. So the celebrations will air each Saturday in a month of September on DCTV 23, Douglas County's Government Access Channel. Each show will have a specific theme and consists of multiple interviews, music performances, and special guests. The Douglas County Government website, www.celebratedouglascounty.com, will be getting a new look, a new look in September, a new website that will be revealed on Tuesday, September 8th at 4 p.m. We'd like to invite the public to join us for the virtual unveiling on the Douglas County Happenings Facebook page. We'd like to invite the public to Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson's Douglas County Virtual Homeowners Association Boot Camp, which is happening on Saturday, September 12th. That is happening from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. RSVP for the event by contacting Ruben Tillman through email. Ruben Tillman's email is rtillman, T-I-L-L-M-A-N, at co.douglas. Dot ga dot us. And that concludes this evening's announcements. Madam Chair, I yield back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Communications Director. And certainly before we close, I want to speak, uh, take a moment and speak to our citizens of Douglas County and echo a lot of our commissioners tonight to show that, to demonstrate that we have done an enormous amount of work to, to certainly drill down on our expenses to prevent uh, uh, at least uh, reduce the pressure on our taxpayers. Uh, certainly I commend our county administrator and the finance team for going above and beyond. And certainly I would be uh, remiss not to show some respect to our constitutional officers and also to our elected officials and our department heads who went far beyond the ordinary to work. And then also our employees also who have taken, uh, they understand that there will be five days of furloughs. Uh, my heart and, and, and pain goes out to all the citizens, in uh, particular our property taxpayers. Uh, I, I just want to make it on a personal note with you. Uh, certainly, we had our budget stress test by one of the uh, organizations that work for the governor. And uh, because of the pandemic, our sales tax are not coming in as uh, projected. So we have had to do some things to double down on cutting expenses, and we've done that. But I'm telling you, it, it, it was painful to my heart when the uh, municipal advisor indicated that Douglas County's sales tax are down. And then also, I didn't even mention that our revenue gen generating departments are not making their money. I can name the ones that we typically bring in revenue, which is, which is our parks and recreation, our libraries are down, and also our sheriff's and court's offices are down. And, and, and also transportation. But the good thing on transportation is that the uh, Federal Highway Administration is uh, uh, bringing in a grant, and I heard a citizen earlier mention grants. They're gonna, we, we will be uh, appropriated a grant of $2.3 million to offset any loss uh, related to Connect Douglas. And uh, so I wanted to make that very clear to the citizens. But I wanted to let you know when, when the uh, municipal advisor uh, met with me and, and shared with me, he said, it's just no, it's not gonna be any way possible without asking for everybody to put some skin in the game, including not only the, the the actual county government, but also to see if the citizens can just give you a little support. Uh, certainly when the times were good, uh, Gabe uh, provided, certainly I worked with the commissioners and I was probably the cheerleader with the pom-poms -pom, pom in her hand asking them to roll back taxes. I uh, didn't realize, now I learned the hard way, we rolled back uh, close to probably close to five million uh, certainly didn't roll back last year, but the first two years, we had two great years. We had new growth. Uh, the previous administration had no growth for the last three years prior to their, like maybe 14 through 16, but 17 and 18 and 19 and 20, we've had some new growth. But uh, when the municipal advisor shared with me, and I'll pivot back a little bit, shared with me that I needed some support from the citizens 
I literally cried because I don't want to ask the citizens for anything. And it, it I'm, I'm very proud. I take great pride in managing budgets and making sure that our citizens uh, are not compromised by any point. So again, I make a commitment that we're continuing to drill down. But at the same time, I'm hoping that we could come back with a zero proposal, but based on COVID-19, which has been certainly just um, astronomical and affected all of us in this entire country, not just Douglas County, but this whole nation, this whole globe has been affected by this moment. And again, uh, we truly love our citizens and we're doing everything we can uh, in this moment. Certainly this moment, I wanna make it clear, is uh, worse than the Great Depression, as uh, our vice chairman made it very clear early that uh, Congress is propping us up. We are on a morphine drip and that's certainly in my wheelhouse, healthcare. And once that drip stops, uh, certainly we, it, it, if, if it did not even t transpire, we would be in a whole different place. So I wanna make it clear that we're all in this together. And my heart is just broken because I don't wanna ask our citizens for anything. And I'm working day and night with the commissioners and I appreciate most importantly, my board of commissioners. They stood with me and tried to find every possible means during our mid-year workshop that we could cut and double down on the expenses. And I don't want to forget them. And I don't take them very, take them lightly at all. Their contribution was massive. Uh, certainly at the mid-year workshop, it should have been one thing. It should have been the board of commissioners or, or should I say the administration, which is my cabinet. We should have presented to the board of commissioners what we were gonna do, but this year was different. I wanted our board of commissioners to participate because I knew that it was not gonna be the same. COVID-19 has changed the landscape of this entire nation and we're doing all we can. And I had another citizen said, what are other counties doing? Cherokee County has a 34% uh, military rate increase on the table. And you have other counties doing the same thing, Chicago, all over. And uh, there's some literature out there that says local governments and uh, uh, municipal uh, governments, it'll be quite a while before they even return to normal. And it may be four to five years, but I must commend my administration. They've done a good job. Uh, we've done uh, better than most have expected. Actually, I can say when I walked into office, it was only $11 million in the coffers and we work magic. We didn't just build one jail. We've, we've changed the landscape of this county. And one thing I can say, we have $4.9 billion in the pipeline. And I've had citizens say, when is the pipeline gonna, when will it mature? That pipeline should start releasing some energy in 2021 at the very end of the year. So thank you for your patience with us. I'm continuing to work with my uh, board of commissioners and I wanna commend them. They have been extraordinary in this moment. And I thank you all personally, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, Commissioner Carthen, uh, Commissioner Guider, and Commissioner uh, Robinson. Thank you all so much. And I appreciate you. And I just could not have done this without you. With no further ado, uh, this meet, if there's nothing else to come before this board, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>